Well, good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2016. We have apologies from Douglas Law, Ross and Mary Fee, and I welcome Claire Baker to the committee as the Labour Party substitute on the committee. Claire, do you have any interests uh, relevant to the committee to declare? Uh, no, I don't have any interest to declare. Thank you very much. Now move on to item agenda number one, which is a, a decision as to whether to take uh, business in private. Our members agreed that we take items eight and nine in private. These items are consideration of a draft report on the Policing and Crime Bill, LCM, and consideration of the committee's work programme. Are members content that these are taken in private? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number two, subordinate legislation. The next item is further consideration of the affirmative SSI on home detention curfew license amendment Scotland order 2016. And I welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, who will speak to the affirmative SSI. Also with the minister today is Linda Pollitt, Deputy Director, Community Justice, Quinton Fisher, Community Justice Division, and Craig McGuffey, Directorate of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. All welcome. And Minister, can I begin by thanking you and your officials for providing the statistics that the committee requested uh, last week. Can I remind members that officials are permitted to give evidence under this item but may not participate in the formal debate on the instrument under item three of the agenda. Right, um, I refer members to paper number one and ask the minister if you want to make uh, an opening statement. Good morning convener, uh, I think in the circumstances I would just refer to the opening statement that I made last week. Okay. Do members have any questions that we've got um, additional information and time to um, look at this, um, that this SSI? Oliver Mundell and Rona McCann. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I s thank the minister as well for uh, providing the additional information. And while I recognise it is a relatively small uh, number of people affected, I think on the broader principle, I've still... I uh, got concerns that it sends out the wrong signal uh, to both offenders and the wider public, because I think at a time when we're looking to enhance uh, community sentencing, there is a danger uh, that we are, uh, that isn't seen to have, or breaching such sentences isn't seen to have consequences, then it does uh, undermine uh, the, the process. And I just wondered whether there's any further reassurance you could give on that. Uh, well, I thank the, the member for his question. Um, in terms of the wider policy uh, objectives, um, I think, as I mentioned last week, uh, what we are looking to do is to remove um, uh, exclu exclusions from possible grant of HDC. It's by no means an automatic grant uh, to certain categories, as discussed in detail last week. Those, in effect, who have committed a, a, a new offence whilst... Uh, out from prison before the end of their sentence has, has come to pass, or those who breach uh, licence conditions, uh, including HDC conditions, whilst out. Uh, and uh, I think we can see from the figures that have been provided uh, to the committee uh, that the, the potential scope uh, in terms of where we are, and I think these figures have been updated to, to help the committee's deliberations to uh, 21st November 2016, uh, and I think we can see that actually uh, the, the figures involved uh, are not uh, substantial. And also it has to be pointed out that the possible uh, uh, individuals who could be brought within scope here, that, that, that these are individuals who would be eligible for consideration. That does not mean that they would be granted HDC. And I think that's important to put uh, on the record as well. Uh, in terms of the wider objectives, what we're seeking to do is to encourage rehabilitation, uh, to encourage reintegration uh, into communities, reintegration, building family relationships, again, reintegration by uh, facilitating uh, productive contributions of individuals to society whilst they're out on HDC, uh, and thereby, of course, with the ultimate objective of reducing reoffending. Uh, and I think that is the, 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 the key uh, principle to note. And of course, I'm sure we all wish to see a reduction in reoffending. And I would also finally add that, of course, 
the, the risk assessment, and I think I stressed this point quite considerably uh, last week, the risk assessment carried out is robust and puts public safety at the very heart of that risk assessment. Uh, and uh, that is uh, it, to ensure uh, that if HDC is granted, it is granted taking into account public safety as primary consideration, looking at issues of possible reoffending or otherwise, and looking at the likelihood of reintegration uh, into society. Thank you. I, I just wonder in terms of uh, considerations around the prison population, whether with the SPS making those decisions, that there might be sort of pressure in effect to, to go ahead and release people back into the community, um, you know, in, in order to, to help manage uh, the population itself, rather than looking uh, as rigorously as you suggest. Uh, at, at the, the sort of needs of the offender and uh, the concerns that communities might have? Uh, no, I, I don't accept that. Uh, in terms also, of course, with regard to long-term prisoners, uh, the, the assessment's carried out not simply by SPS, but also by the, the Pro Board. I don't know if officials would like to make any further comment about that suggestion that the prison service would uh, factor in uh, prisoner number management into its risk assessment. Yep. That's fair to say, uh, as the Minister has said, for longer term prison sentences it would be parole board that would agree at the half, uh, halfway point. And also it's worth noting that criminal justice social work took part of the risk assessment in the community as well. So I think the, the prison service take their job very seriously and do their risk assessment very thoroughly so that the prison population is not one of the factors that would come into that, but rather the, the risk profile of the offender, whether there is a risk to the public, risk of reoffending, and criminal justice social worker looking in, in the community as well about the, the risk in returning to the community, and in particular the house and the home that they would be returning to. So it's a very thorough risk assessment that is undertaken. Okay, and can I finally just ask again about ministerial oversight? Um, I know that uh, Mr McGuffey uh, provided you know, some answers last week, but I was just slightly concerned about the suggestion that Scottish ministers would have uh, a, a role in that and they might be involved at an administrative level. Um, and I, I just wondered if there was any, if there was a more clarified position this week. Well, if I could just say that uh, the point that was being made was that the Scottish Prison Service Act as the uh, executive agency, they have delegated authority. Uh, there's a framework in agreement in place as between the Scottish Government and the Prison Service, which is on the, the website, uh, which explains in broad brush how the, the, the direction uh, is to be, the policy is to be implemented. Uh, and uh, in terms of any uh, authority that's delegated, ultimately control can be taken back, but as a matter of practice, that's not the case. And again, I would ask officials just to uh, clarify the de further detail of that. That's, as the Minister has said, that's absolutely correct. There's delegated authority, which is given to the Chief Executive of the Prison Service that is published in the Framework Agreement, which you can find online. And in that, it states all of the areas where the, chief, the Prison Service would have delegated authority in instances such as this, as we have just gone through, the prison service are the people who look at the risk assessment. They are the people that are working with these offenders on a daily basis. And so it's right and proper that they are the people that are making this recommendation and this decision. So do you envisage any scenario in which the cabinet secretary or a minister would be involved in an individual decision? The power has been delegated to the chief executive of the prison service. It's obviously the chief executive is accountable to ministers, ministers are accountable to the parliament, but the day-to-day -day management of the an operation of prisons is done through the prison service. So the, just to be absolutely clear for the record, the uh, position that was set out last week is incorrect, uh, no. that ministers would be involved on an administrative level. This is just restating what was said last week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I thank the Minister for bringing the statistics to the committee this week? Um, and I was very heartened to see that only 6% of HDCs are due to reoffending. Does the Minister agree with me that um, this proves the validity of the, the system and that this is a system that does actually work? Yes, I, I would. Uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, clear if we look at the um, reoffending, latest reoffending stats of this year uh, that are uh, uh, out thus far, which show that we are at a 17 year low in terms of reoffending. I think that shows uh, indeed that uh, policies uh, concerning inter alia HDC uh, do make a difference and facilitate rehabilitation. Uh, and reduce reoffending. And I, as I said before, last week and earlier uh, this morning, I'm sure that we all wish to see a reduction in, in reoffending. Uh, and uh, uh, electronic monitoring in the form of HDC uh, does allow us to do that. 
Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? Uh, Minister, I must say that I have some reservations here. 6% is a percentage. We're talking about individuals here who have committed a crime, who are out on, on licence, um, who have breached the licence conditions, have home detention curfew, but yet are, are seen to be, again, given another chance. And I wonder where victims and um, all those people that have seen the original sentence being imposed and automatic early release then kicking in, and then this uh, conditions to be breached or even another crime to uh, have been committed, uh, then still being at liberty. So my position is that the statutory, um, the original statutory exemptions were there for good purpose. I think they provide a very strong deterrent. Um, they enforced the, um, the severity of breaching these, um, of these conditions. And I feel if we were to look at this, and we do want to encourage community disposals where appropriate, it should have been done in a wider debate on the whole um, community justice um, aspect. So for that reason, then, I'm, I wouldn't be too happy about this. I don't know if anyone else has any comments. Stuart, Stuart and then um, John Finney. Uh, thank you very much, convener. I note, uh, Minister, from memory that uh, re-offending, which is calculated, I believe, is another offence within two years, uh, of prisoners released is more of the order of about half or thereabouts. Uh, do, do you have that number to hand? So if we create a context that 6%, albeit will cover a different time frame than the two years, uh, stands very good comparison with the population that's released from prison as a whole. Uh, and furthermore, community sentences, I, I, I think again the reoffending rates are substantially ahead. So one could almost argue that uh, if only every other way in which we dispose of prisoners was as successful as this, we would be very happy indeed. Is that correct? Uh, I, 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 I agree that uh, the stats on HDC do show a, 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 a low, a relatively low uh, level of uh, reoffending, and I, I do think that's to be welcome. I do think it is indicative of the fact that this is an important tool uh, open uh, to community justice partners uh, to facilitate reintegration into the community and reduce reoffending, which I, I come again to, to that point. Just to pick up a point that the convener raised, uh, and I think I made last week, uh, comprised on this working group were, of course, Scottish Women's Aid, and that they were uh, an active participant in the deliberations and indeed signed up to the final report, which was to include inter alia this recommendation that these uh, hitherto excluded categories of people, of individuals, should now be uh, included in a possible grant of HDC. And I state again, HDC is by no means automatic. It is subject to a robust risk assessment on the grounds that I have uh, explained. Any? And Ben? Just, uh, supplementary to, to, to what the Minister said, I just wondered if the Minister could comment on, uh, there was a, a concern raised there about the, the scope and the breadth of the examination of the issue, but it is, it's my understanding that the working group, uh, as well as uh, Scottish Women's Aid, comprised the prison service, police, independent researchers, social work practitioners, and a, a representative of, of Scottish Women's Aid, and uh, covered, uh, was encompassed 16 months of, of work, as well as uh, looking at international evidence. So the, to me, that seems like a robust and uh, ex extremely uh, thorough examination of this issue to then bring a, a proposal from the, the working group. I, I think I made the point last week that there had been a substantial engagement and of course the, the, the final report was informed not just by the statistics in terms of the, the, these, the, the, these were made available to, to the working group, but also uh, international evidence, other academic research, the engagement that uh, Ben McPherson talks about both at a national and local level, uh, the actual expertise and knowledge that these individuals brought uh, to their 16-month deliberation and included also for the sake of completeness in the, the, the lifetime of the working group with the Judicial Institute for Scotland in addition to the, the, the members that the, the Ben McPherson raised. Uh, so SBS Head of Parole Units, uh, Violence Reduction Units, the National Offender Management Unit, uh, uh, also 
uh, Police Scotland Specialist Crime Division and the Centre of Youth and Criminal Justice. So there really were uh, available to this working group a panel of, of experts in their field and frontline practitioners. Uh, and I think that uh, illustrates the point well that Mr McPherson made, that this was a very extensive look at, look at this issue. And uh, Liam, followed by Fulton. Thanks very much. Uh, Convener, it's following up um, Stuart Stevenson's comments. I mean, I, I, I suspect what we're doing here is, is managing risk. I mean, that's um, essentially what's at, at root here. And, and 6% to me seems to be um, uh, not necessarily the, the threshold of success. I'm sure that, um, everybody involved would, would, would look to bring that figure down if they could. But, but nevertheless, I, I think if we were to demand something um, approximating 0%, we'd be asking for a guarantee that um, seems unrealistic in, in most of the other endeavours we, uh, we, we embark on with legislation. But I, I suppose as, as, as a government, you will be looking to see how this um, operates in practice. And if that 6% were to, to nudge up over time um, with, uh, with a change in, in uh, the, the, the process, presumably you would look to, uh, to see why that is and, and, and potentially uh, make alterations uh, uh, accordingly. Would that be a fair assessment? I, I think so, yes. I, I think the member makes a fair point um, that there, we can't guarantee zero. We would like to, but in every human endeavour, it is always very difficult to, to guarantee 100% success rate. But I, I think the figures do show uh, that the, the risk is being managed very well indeed uh, in relative terms. And uh, certainly these uh, stats are, are looked at by officials on a regular basis. I would also add, uh, of course, in a point raised by Mr Finney last week, the important point also raised in the working group of uh, how can we uh, better support uh, individuals in these circumstances to facilitate compliance, and there will be a demonstration pilot project on that very issue early uh, next year in terms of current plans. So I think that's a very important element of how we uh, uh, seek to improve uh, these rates further, as the member would like to, to see. Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I think, uh, as a, an ex-criminal justice social worker, it would be remiss of me not to challenge some of the um, perceptions that are perhaps around uh, about HDC being, you know, somewhat of an, e an easy option uh, for offenders. I mean, it, it's a very robust um, situation and actually is a very crucial part of the process in allowing offenders to move from prison back to the community, as the Minister's already said. And I think that what, what members, you know, might like to know is that when, when prisoners come straight out from prison into the community, the rates of reoffending are much higher, and the research clearly indicates that. So it was more a, a comment for the record, Convener. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any other comments or questions for the Minister? Minister, do you want to make a, a closing statement? No, thank you. Uh, in that case, we move to agenda item number three, which is formal consideration of motion 02127 that the Justice Committee recommends home detention curfew license amendment Scotland Order 2016 draft be approved. Um, Minister, do you want to speak and move to the motion? I, I just formally move the motion. Thank you, Convener. Yeah. Um, any members wish to speak? Stuart Stevenson, John Finney. Um, I just remind members that the 1991 uh, white paper that the Tories brought forward in criminal justice contained the memorable quote, prison is an expensive way of making bad people worse. Anything that keeps people and gets people out of prison is something we should be supporting. Okay, thank you for that contribution and probably by way of repost, <laughs> which is, is useful. I repeat that I think given all the people that and the report that we had before, I think it's really regrettable that this wasn't the subject of a parliamentary debate on the wider issue of community justice and where this perpetual pro particular proposal, which has been brought under a negative, uh, uh, sorry, an affirmative S SI, um, could have taken place. Uh, John Finney. Hey, thank you, Convener. I, I'm conscious there's been no attempt to curtail any debate, so I, I think there, we've heard a range of views here, and uh, it, it's not that there's not been discussion. I have to say the Scottish Green Party welcome this proposal, strongly welcome this proposal. Um, it is about, as the Minister says, it's an option, and it's also reintegration. I also would be very concerned if any unintended offence were taken by the wide range of participants who, who are behind this report there, because 
Um, arriving at this position might be seen as controversial by some people, I suspect, a, a small minority, but when you have people like Scottish Women's Aid, who have the victim's interest at the forefront of all their deliberations, sharing this collective view with frontline practitioners, then that makes a very compelling case for me, and I'll certainly be lending my support to it. Okay. Uh, are there any other views from members? Um, and, uh, right, and I invite the Minister to wind up. Do you wish to say anything about uh, no, I, I entirely agree with uh, Mr Finney's comments. I think it's an important point to put on the record that uh, actually, you know, these uh, individuals from all the various spheres uh, put in a, an awful lot of their time uh, to do this, including uh, important victims' organisations like Scottish Women's Aid, and uh, I think their uh, opinions are worth listening to. OK, thank you, Minister. The question is that motion 02127 in the name of Annabel Ewing be approved. Are we all agreed? No. <laughs> so there will be a division. All those in favour? All those against? Right. Two, four. Right, there has been a division. And members contend that... Uh, oh, sorry, um, I, I'll read the... Sorry. There's a division and it was eight for the motion, two against. Since there was a division, um, are members content that as convener I clear the final draft report or would you prefer to see it before it's cleared? Content. 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 Yeah. Thank you for that. Right, the next item, call for a brief. All oh, right, we need a suspension to change witnesses. Thank you. on the agenda is consideration of affirmative SSI on air weapons licensing exemption Scotland regulations 2016 draft and I welcome back to the committee the minister and also the officials accompanying her Keith Main Safer Communities Division and Carla McCloy Stevens director for legal services with the Scottish Government um, I refer members to paper two which is a note by the clerk Minister, do you want to make uh, an opening statement? Yes, if, if that would be okay, Convener. Thank you. Um, uh, the new licensing regime for air weapons in Scotland is set out in part one of the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Act 2015. Implementation is well underway, and from 31 December this year, it will be an offence for anyone to have or use an air weapon without an air weapon certificate or permit, unless they are otherwise exempt. Schedule one of the 2015 Act sets out various exemptions. These reflect similar exemptions in the licensing regime for more powerful firearms and shotguns. This ensures consistency between the two licensing regimes, which is helpful to both the police, who are the licensing authority, and the shooting community. The purpose of the draft regulations before the committee today is to add two further exemptions to Schedule 1 of the 2015 Act. The additions are being made at the request of the Ministry of Defence and replicate exemptions from the firearms licensing regime under Section 16A and 16B of the Firearms Amendment Act of 1988. The first exemption covers the possession and use of air weapons by civilians whilst on service premises and under the supervision of military personnel. For example, it would allow a person to shoot air weapons without holding an air weapon certificate at a properly supervised shooting gallery, which is set up, uh, for example, as part of an open day or a family or com community event on service premises. Uh, it, it may interest the committee to note that open days and other events take place at barracks and other, other military bases throughout the year. Such events are generally focused on recruitment, but they can also be aimed at military families or the wider community, helping to maintain important links with the local area. The second exemption covers the possession and use of air weapons on Ministry of Defence police premises by people who are undergoing firearms training and assessment under the supervision of Ministry of Defence police personnel. Both these exemptions relate to Ministry of Defence matters which are considered to be reserved. The Scottish Government believes it is appropriate to add these exemptions. It should be noted that Schedule 1 explicitly exempts other reserved matters from the regulation of Part 1 of the 2015 Act, for example, the possession and use 
uh, of air weapons by members of Her Majesty's Armed Forces and the Ministry of Defence Police in the course of their duties. These regulations before the committee today will help, though, to make it clear who is and who is not subject to the new air weapons licensing regime. And they do reflect equivalent exemptions from the wider firearms licensing regime and are consistent with the other air weapons licensing exemptions set out in Schedule 1 of the 2015 Act. Finally, convener, given that shooting in such circumstances may only be undertaken under the strict supervision of military personnel, it is not considered that the inclusion of these exemptions should involve any adverse impact in terms of public safety. Thank you. Minister, do uh, members have any questions for the Minister? If uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, it, it's just to make an obvious uh, a comment. I do have Ministry of Defence police in my constituency guarding uh, the St Fergus uh, gas terminal, which is a part of the critical national infrastructure. And I think um, those police having the powers that are conferred by this uh, piece of subordinate legislation, if passed by Parliament, is an appropriate thing for them to have. Okay. Uh, Liam? Of, uh, Stuart Stevenson's comments, I mean, I, I, I think I would want to note again the reservations that I and my uh, colleagues have with original legislation, but I think the exemptions being brought forward under this, uh, this statutory instrument are, are very sensible and ones we would support. Noted. Any other comments or questions? If not, we move to agenda item five, which is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument and the motion is motion 02262 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Air Weapons Licensing Exemption Scotland Regulations 2016 be approved. Minister to move the motion and I move formally. Okay, okay, thank you. Are there any uh, questions, further questions or comments from um, members? If not, then I put the question that motion 02262 in the name of Michael Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you for that. Um, that concludes consideration of both affirmative instruments on today's agenda. The committee, um, I'm asking the committee again, are you content to delegate um, authority to me to approve the final report. Content. Thank you for that. Can I thank the Minister and her officials for attending and I now suspend briefly to allow the Minister to leave. Agenda item six, important legislation, is consideration of five negative SSIs. The first is Justice of the Peace Training and Appraisal Scotland Order 2016, SSI 2016, oblique 329. Do members have any comments on this statutory instrument? No? Happy to approve? Okay. Uh, the next item, yeah. at the end, um, once I've gone through the list, um, we'll, we'll see if there are all no recommendation or, or if there's anything that there wouldn't be. I'm taking them one at a time. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Number two, court fees, miscellaneous amendment, Scotland, order 2000, uh, 2016, SSI 2016, oblique 332. Um, members will be aware that the Law Society has made a submission in, in um, terms of this uh, statutory instrument. Are there any questions or comments? Liam MacArthur. As you uh, noted, the Law Society have, have been in touch around this SI, which is very similar, I think, to the, the one we considered uh, last week, um, raising, I think, many of the, the same concerns around um, the, the impact on, on access to justice. Um, I think the, the government in its papers confirmed that the, the, the consultation they ran on this showed an overwhelming um, resistance to the, the increase in court fees. I, I know we're operating to a reasonably tight deadline because I think the SI comes into effect from the 28th of 
of November. Um, but uh, I, I think the Law Society raised some uh, interesting points about um, even looking at the, the eligibility thresholds and, and how those bear comparison with inflation over, over time. Um, I think in their, uh, in their submission they say um, if they were f forced to offer an opinion on, on option one, a flat rate, increase or option two, a targeted increase, the, the preference would be for option two, which is hardly surprising. But um, I think if there is any time available to, to, to see uh, how the government proposes to amend these over time in line with inflation around the eligi eligibility criteria thresholds, then that would be, that would be helpful. My understanding to that specific point is that the committee has to 5th of December to report to Parliament on all of these instruments, so therefore the committee could consider this instrument again at next week meeting if, as um, you suggest, Liam MacArthur, we want to just put some of these points and take further. I think, uh, as I said in relation to the SI um, last time round, I mean, I think um, I can understand why there's a resistance to, to, to increasing mm. fees at any, any stage, and it, it may simply be that what we're talking about are modest increases, but the concerns raised in relation to this SI do seem to be um, uh, more serious in, in, in a sense in relation to uh, the impact on, on access to justice. So if there is time available to, to satisfy ourselves that um, we are we're, we're approving something that's as targeted as it can be um, against the backdrop of, of um, the government's stated intention to try and cover uh, the cost of, of, um, of court fees more, uh, more effectively, then that would be, I think, my preference. Okay. Stuart, followed by Oliver. Uh, thank you, convener. I, we certainly had a discussion on this, quite a full discussion on this uh, last week. I think the point that Liam MacArthur makes, that it may be reasonable to ask the government what its longer-term intentions are in relation to uh, progressing the agenda on um, uh, full recovery of court fees, which was one that was introduced by the Labour Liberal Administration uh, before 2007 and is clearly a long-term plan. But I, th I think it would be perfectly proper to ask the government uh, uh, how they are going to continue with that policy that was introduced by the Liberal uh, Labour Administration. Um, but I think in view of the uh, very full discussion we had last week that uh, we should not uh, uh, seek to delay this particular instrument. Um, just to clarify, uh, you, you obviously weren't here last week, uh, Liam, but uh, I think we're stretching a point to say it was a full discussion. Uh, I did um, express some reservations about access to justice considerations with these court fees, albeit it was a very, very uh, minor increase in the fees. So I certainly welcome um, Liam's um, indication that we could find out a little bit more. Oliver followed by John, followed by Rona. Um, I, I fully agree with Liam. I don't know that we'd be delaying it by, by looking at it. If we've got until the 5th of December, I think it's perfectly reasonable uh, to, to raise some of those questions, particularly around the longer term plans. And I, I, I feel we only just got started on that issue last time round and uh, that given the sort of strong representations from the Law Society, uh, we should make the time to consider it fully. And John, followed by Rona. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I pl place great store on in the information we get from the, the, the Law Society. I think it's always very compelling. However, I have to say in this case, I thought it was an extremely poor comparator that was offered up. The, the legislation enacted by the UK government that saw um, fees introduced from zero to £1,200 obviously had that significant effect. When I see changes like £78 to £100, for what's likely to be the bulk of, of claims. I, I don't see that as, as, as being in the same category. Now, I have to say, the specifics of this are separate from the government's overall plans, and, and, and I think Liam makes a very valid point, and I'm very happy to, 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 to try and understand that, but I always look for uh, access to justice issues and protection of the vulnerable, and when I see, for instance, there's no change to the adults with incapacity uh, regulations 2015, when I see that these don't affect the increases that we agreed, the legislation earlier on, the share of court appeal and the share of personal injury, when I read that those in receipt, and in fairness, the, the Law Society briefing does say this, those in receipt of legal aid will not incur any court fees, then they're, and on top of what in some instances are very modest increases, there seems to me to be the, the same level of protection that I referred to last week. So I'm comfortable that we make a decision on that today, but by all means try and understand the longer term objectives of the... Okay, and we've got uh, Rona followed by Ben. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I say I have to agree with um, my colleague John Finney and Stuart Stevenson. Um, I don't think there's anything terribly radical in the detail of these court fees that are being proposed, um, but I do agree on the, the wider issue. We should, we should look to see what the government's um, proposal is. Given that this is the third time we've been discussing this, I don't see any merit in delaying it and what we would achieve in the short time span of from now till December the 4th. Uh, I think we should move ahead with it. Um, followed by Ben. Likewise, I, I see uh, no need to, to delay. While I appreciate the, the, the uh, collective determination in the room to, to have a long-term analysis in, in tandem, I think uh, John Finney made the point that while the Law Society paper does uh, make some reservations, it also states very clearly that the legal aid scheme in Scotland also ensures that people eligible for the scheme do not have to pay their court fees. Also, if unsuccessful, people who are legally aided do not need to pay the court fees of their opponent, and it makes that explicitly clear, and I think that should be recognised. I think one of the compelling things in the Law Society's um, submission was uh, employment tribunals and the dramatic fall in people presenting there, which did seem to suggest that there was a barrier, and that barrier was the increase in, in court fees, potentially. So we have um, a proposal, this is continued to next week, to, to seek further evidence to... Um, from uh, our further response from the government to properly tease this issue out. Um, I think last week I, I did raise the issue um, that the last Justice Committee made a very strong um, statement that it didn't believe that court fees should be um, used to pay for the reforms, and there are um, substantial reforms still not implemented and, and further in the, um, in the pipeline. So there, there are quite a few issues surrounding this. Are members content to continue to seek no. further? No. no, you're not content. Uh, Liam MacArthur? Just trying to break the logjam I appear to have created. Um, <laughs> I, I, I understand from discussions with the clerks that um, this SI, even if we were to seek official, um, further information, uh, would actually come into effect on the 28th of, of November in any event. Um, it would simply just delay the process of, of approval uh, in a parliamentary sense. I mean, I'd, 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 I'd hear what John and colleagues have said in relation to the, the, the increases in, in fees. I, I think I, I, there's still a question as to why the, the Law Society submitted their, uh, the, the, their paper to the committee um, so late in the day. But I think if there's an opportunity to, to explore the, uh, the issues that they've highlighted in their paper in more detail, I don't see the, the, the downside of doing that, um, particularly in light of the fact that it doesn't appear to, uh, to be the case that it would delay the, the implementation of the SI in any way. So can I be clear about what you'd be moving um, uh, or suggesting, Liam? Are you suggesting that we make no recommendation today along with possibly some of the other instruments we're making no recommendation but yet seek another response from the Scottish Government to flesh out some of these um, issues raised or that um, we don't make no right we'll put that that instrument to one side until we get further um, information from the government be to, to, to set it aside but I mean I think the, the the overwhelming view of the committee appears to be that um, we, we press ahead with it so I mean I, I think that the general context of, of cost recovery is is information that we, we do need to get um, from the government and um, there seems to be kind of pretty much unanimity around that as I say my preference would be to to, to use the time we have available uh, the 5th of December to um, to, to, to tease those issues out but uh, I'm sympathetic to that. I'm very conscious, both John Finney and I sat in the last, um, the last um, Justice Committee. Uh, we as a committee have looked at a broad theme of access to justice, and uh, I think there, there is no question that it, it raises potentially, not necessarily actual when you actually get down to it, not necessarily the case, but enough for for me to think that what Liam's proposing seems a reasonable way forward, John Finney. Um, I'm a wee bit concerned at your continual reference to access to justice and an inference that, where, that, that your position on this not to be supported, that somehow that would mean that the individuals who took that position weren't supportive of access to justice. Everything I said in relation to my qualification of this and last week was about access to justice. Access to justice is to ensure that people receive protections. I outlined the protections behind this. I'm very relaxed about, but I, I, it would be very disappointing if there was a misrepresentation of the position of what was said in the, in the last report. 
Well, I think it was really concerns about potential access to justice, um, which may or may not be realised, and that was why, essentially, we're looking for more information. John? Well, the, 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 the issue that's been alluded to was employment tribunals. If you were outspoken, mm. as I was, on the opposition to fees to that, then that perhaps would strengthen your position, convener, but I, I don't recall that. Um, so th th that's been cited by yourself as a comparator. That's a, that was a UK reserved issue. It's coming to Scotland. Um, I don't recall outpourings about from you or your party about access to justice connected with that, and we've seen the dramatic effect this has. I've outlined the protections that are there to ensure that access to justice will continue. And so I, I would be keen to make a decision today. Can I assure John uh, Finney that my comments are coming from the presentation that we've received, the written response we've received from the Law Society, and the quite startling figures about the drop in people presenting now, here and now, hard figures um, as, a, as a result of the court fees. However, we have two... Uh, tribunal fees. Uh, sorry, uh, tribunal uh, fees. Which, uh, Employment which I, I, tribunal again, fees. Say it's a UK reserve matter. Yeah. W whichever it is, then, there has been a, a drop and that evidence has been presented and it's on the ba basis of that that I made my comments. Right. Liam, are you uh, moving that this is postponed to next meeting and we make no or are you content I'm, I'm content to seek the wider information that we've we've sought but make no recommendation make no in the meantime i think it's been sorry just for yeah. clarity yes. so that we may understand the second decision that we're clearly going all going to support um i think what liam asked for and which i supported was asking government for the bigger picture about this where are they going after this with the recovery of costs rather than you know narrowly focusing on the particular instruments I'm, I'm not excluding information on the current instrument but i think what liam was saying was a bigger picture stuff so that the next time we find an instrument before us we can refer back to what the government then you know is there a, and just to be absolutely clear that's what i think, I think we're going for and i would yes. welcome yeah. others liam MacArthur. I, I think that is um, uh, it's entirely accurate. I, I think within that, what I would particularly like to, to see is, is um, what the approach is going to be in terms of the, the eligibility thresholds and how that compares mm -hmm. with, with inflation over time. I think, I think the Law Society again raised some sensible concerns around this, the situation south of the border where you can be at risk of overcomplicating um, the, the, uh, the, the setup by, uh, by subdividing thresholds and all the rest of it. So uh, I think getting a clearer sense of where the government plans to go in that respect would be helpful. That's helpful. We've reached, I believe, a consensus point that we make no recommendation, but a wider um, look at this whole issue of the court fees uh, within uh, the context of various issues is looked at at the next meeting. Are we content to, to proceed in that manner? Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry for my uh, uh, ignorance on this. Only uh, ten, 10 meetings or so in. What, what does that then mean? What, what have we agreed there? It goes ahead. It goes ahead, but, but we get more information on the wider issue. Okay, thank yeah. you. Josh. Okay, if we're content, we shall move on to the next statutory uh, instrument, which is Upper Tribunal for Scotland Rules of Procedure Amendment Regulations 2016 SSI 201633. Three. Do members have any questions or comments? No. Um, so, no recommend, uh, content to make no recommendation? Yeah. yeah. Um, number four, Tenant Information Packs Assure Tenancy Scotland Amendment Order 2016 SSI 2016 oblique 334. Do members have any comments or questions? No. no. Content to make no recommendation? Thank you. And First Tier Tribunal for Scotland Housing and Property Chamber Procedure Regulations 2016, SSI 2016, oblique 339. Do members have any questions or comments? No. Okay. Um, if members have no uh, further questions or comment, then are we are, uh, agreed that we make no recommendation on this last one and, in fact, all five uh, negative statutory instruments. Great. Right, thank you for that. Um, we now will suspend briefly to allow the first panel of witnesses in our inquiry to take their seats.
to agenda item seven, evidence session for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Inquiry. And this is our fourth week of evidence taking on the Crown and Procurator Fiscal uh, Service Inquiry. And I welcome our two witnesses this morning, Sam McEwen, GP, Justice of the Peace, and John Little, Justice of the Peace, both of the Sheriffdom of North Strathclyde. You're very welcome. Can I thank Mr. McEwen for providing written submission, and Mr. Little for agreeing to appear at short notice. The witness whom Mr. Little is replacing was due to speak on behalf of the Scottish Justice Association, but I should make clear for the record that it's our understanding that Mr. Little will be giving evidence today in a personal capacity as a serving JP, is that correct? And some of our questions might refer to matters in the SGA's written submission, and I hope that both justices um, will be able to comment on that written submission. And I refer members to paper number four and paper number five. Right, can I have questions from members, please, who would like to start? John Finney. Thank you, Convena. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, uh, thank you for your written submissions and uh, for attending here today. Um, there's a suggestion of a lack of resources for the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and the impact that that has in your courts. Can you maybe comment on how that materialises, please? Certainly. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Convena, for uh, asking us to come along this morning. We consider this to be extremely component. It was interesting hearing the last debate on the uh, access to justice. This really goes to the heart of that. I consider, and I hope I've made it clear in my paper, that for me and for the vast majority of my colleagues, fiscals are the gateway to the justice system. The lack of, just, the lack of uh, fiscals uh, has coincided with an increase in the, uh, the number of direct measures, fixed penalties and fiscal fines. Uh, which really, I would contend, have uh, more to do with number crunching than with justice, or perhaps even more importantly, if, there is, if it can be more important, the, the ability of a judge at a justice of the peace level, or indeed any level, to arrive at an appropriate sentence for some of the people that we see. What has happened with the... There, are, there is a shortage of fiscals. I don't think anyone would deny that. Uh, courts like Greenock do no longer have a dedicated fiscal, which means cases uh, are marked in the... There are two marking teams, one in Stirling and one in Paisley, uh, and they mark cases, I believe, for all of the... the vast majority of the country, if not all of it. There may be one in the north of Scotland, I can't be entirely sure. Um, so cases are delayed. Um, it leads to uh, an unholy scramble about the court when there's custodies. We don't have a fiscal. The justice is hanging around for three hours. More importantly, the person who has been lifted on warrant by the police the night before has spent the evening and the night in the cells uh, and is then brought to the court sometimes th two, three in the afternoon. Once we've managed to get a, a fiscal to come down from Paisley uh, and we've managed to find a courtroom. And I would remind the committee at this stage that it's highly likely that that individual who has been kept overnight has not been found guilty of anything. If I, so if, if I may, is that... Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, happy. I'm not wanting to break your flow. You're no, no. <laughs> um, well, if, I, if you don't want to break my flow, if, if you don't mind, I will continue. Because it, the, I mentioned the, the, the drop in fiscals coinciding with fixed penalties. Um, then we see lots of people in the district court who are some, are, some are unsavoury. An awful lot more are victims of life. They're addled with addiction. They, um, they haven't had the best of luck. And they'll appear in front of us now at what we call a fine enforcement court. And we see people who are on minimum benefits, who are struggling with addiction, and who present for the first time in court with values of fines stretching back years, many years in some cases, around. I, I can give you an example of people coming in front of me with £875 worth of fixed penalty fines, 
John has an example here of well over a thousand. We see people with fines of fines uh, not being paid of well over a thousand pounds, never ever having been in court. So there, and these are people. Sorry, these are people who have no no money. You know, you can you can give someone a fixed penalty for a hundred pounds, and it, and if if they are suffering from the curse of addiction, it's highly unlikely that they'll, in fact they will not remember. Let's be absolutely frank; they will not remember. And without wishing to be disrespectful to these folk, they'll not see sixty pounds. They'll not see sixty pounds or a hundred pounds in the same place for for very long, if ever at all. And there is no chance, therefore, with the fixed penalty scheme to intervene, to take a look, to try to apportion that. But if you're talking about sentencing, sentencing should be appropriate. And appropriate may be, and I, I quote an example, sorry, I will shut up in a minute, uh, to say, maybe I'm going to uh, give you six months to see how you behave, but perhaps it would be a good idea if you contacted alcohol services, AAA, that kind of thing. We can't send people there, but we can strongly recommend it. And we, in Inverclyde, we have an agreement with the local AA people who will help monitor that so that when the individual come back, we will know if they've tried to help their addiction. So you can make sensible and appropriate uh, decisions rather than just dishing out fines willy-nilly as happens today. Uh, Mr. McEwen, yeah, no, uh, sorry, sorry, baking your flow there. You've covered a lot of issues, and I'm sure colleagues will pick up maybe on the alternatives to prosecution. Can I pick up on something that you, you said in your statement, please? And that's um, your remarks about, and I quote here, planned erosion and support to the GP courts. Could you comment on that, please? What? I think since, uh, since the failure of uh, the McInnes report to effectively uh, do away with the Justice of the Peace Court and, uh, and replace it with... Um, I think what was called at that time would be deputy sheriffs, which is a wee bit like something out of high noon, but uh, deputy sheriffs. Um, now, that, that motion, that, that proposal, not motion, beg your pardon, that proposal uh, failed because uh, the civil service, the people in the Justice Department at that time, and McInnes himself, failed to realise that um, justices of the peace in those days tended to be uh, appointed by a tap on the shoulder, usually from uh, political parties. And that's how I became a, a justice of the peace. My late father was a justice. He was also a councillor locally. Uh, so that's where it came to me. I'd served in the children's panel for a while and the tap on the shoulder came and I was of interest and I did it. And what uh, McInnes and uh, his officials forgot was that um, once you have political contacts, you tend to use them. Mr. Finney, you know, so uh, all of a sudden the then uh, Minister for Justice, can't remember who it was, um, was being assaulted in the tea room by people saying, hey, hold on a minute, I've just appointed Mary and Joe Bloggs as Justice of the Peace. They're good, solid citizens, and all of a sudden their opportunity to be volunteers in their community has been taken from them. And it's important that everyone knows that as justices of the peace, we are volunteers. We do not take salaries. Some of us don't even take expenses. We, we do it because we believe in the concept of local justice and lay justice. We don't pretend we're sheriffs. We don't pretend we're high court judges. We pre but what we do very well is deal with the issues that, that uh, affect <laughs> our local citizens. And we, and we try to handle that, as I mentioned, appropriately. So since McInnes, and I remember counselling my colleagues at the time, and John will verify this, that where we can celebrate the victory, civil servants will always come back and, 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 and try to get their way. And that is what's been happening, in my view, over, over the years. Um, so less and less cases coming to court. My first case, as a, a, in those days a young justice, uh, was... Uh, an assault, uh, I don't know if any of you know old Greenock, but then we had a, a ballroom in Greenock called the Palladium Ballroom, which uh, it, it was for ladies who and gents who perhaps had missed out on the finishing school experience, uh, you know, in sweet uh, And these uh, three young ladies had decided it would be a really good idea to assault a, a young man with their stiletto heels. But, um, now, you, you can imagine, I mean, that... So we were, it was an interesting case, it was assault, and we used to regularly get assaults, and it's a serious nature, I laugh now when they talk about uh, 
maybe giving uh, domestic cases, some domestic cases to the GP court. We used to have those as well. It, uh, we did all sorts of things. You would, your, your court would run from a Monday to a Friday. Uh, John and I used to share the court with two days on, we'd, I think it was one day off, and it would be two days on, two days off, and it would be trials just about all the time. You started at 10, you'd finish at five. Nowadays, we do not see that. The numbers have dropped, and the reason the numbers have dropped is because the, the, uh, the cases have been handled by direct measures. Um, yes, just on, on to go to the erosion term there the, and, and the importance it's placed on local justice. And, uh, um, your evidence talks about there not being a local fiscal. Can you explain what the impact of that might be? Yeah, I mean, there used to be, um, there would be a fiscal based in each court. Um, so local justice, as the name suggests, is based on dealing with issues which, some of which, have a local aspect. And if I can give you a, an example, if you don't mind, that's a very recent example. Inverclyde is, uh, is going through, as lots of communities are, going through a time of change, shipbuilding's gone, engineering's gone, apart from uh, Ferguson's. Um, the electronics industry is all but away. So it's, it's hard, and it's, as it is in many communities throughout the country. Um, but Councils are working hard to try to revitalise, and, and the housing stock's been, been improved greatly. I used to sit on the board of River Clyde Homes, so a lot of money's been spent, a lot of public money's been spent providing housing for people. And vandalism would become an issue, and antisocial behaviour in vandalism. Now, to a High Court judge or a, an appeal judge, Really, vandalism in Greenock is not really top of their list, and nor should it be. But to someone who lives in the community and judges people within the community, we understand exactly what that means to the people who live there. Um, so a local fiscal would also know that. So when a case comes in front of the local fiscal, whoever they may be, they would look at it and think, well, hold on a minute, that is an issue. That's an issue for that particular area and the vast majority of law-abiding people who work there, their lives are being, their, who live there, I beg your pardon, their lives are being blighted by this. And that case would, it wouldn't be a fiscal fine that would be dealt with that. That would then would be passed to the justice, passed to the court, to, justice would hear evidence and, and if the, the, the verdict was guilty, um, sentence appropriately so that and what does appropriately mean it means that the victims of the uh, of the vandalism the antisocial behavior see that, that uh, it's been taken seriously uh, and been addressed appropriately also means is that and sometimes this can make you unpopular as a justice but but the fines perhaps handed out the compensation packages handed out uh, are in line with what the means of the individual are. So there is a, uh, there is a sensible, hopeful, uh, hopefully a sensible balance struck between taking care of the, our law-abiding citizens while letting our uh, less law-abiding citizens be made aware that it's not acceptable, they need to do something, and they will feel a bit of pain in their pocket uh, if they don't cease and desist, desist their uh, their antisocial behaviour. Now, a local fiscal is vital to that. If you sit in Paisley and you've got a big pile for Aberdeen here and another big pile for Inverclyde here and, you know, and Perth over here, you're, you're just going to... It's... A, it, it's um, the other issue which members yeah. may want to, okay. to question both does that, does that, that's very well, I'll conclude there. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Okay. If it's a very short supplementary, Stuart Stevenson, yeah. It's a very narrow point, yeah. convener. I'm sure it'll be helpful. Uh, Sam uh, McEwen referred to fixed penalties, and I just wanted to be clear um, that the problem that was being described related to them being imposed on people who had no means to pay, and that therefore... Is it being suggested that fixed penalties, of course, don't come from the C Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, but from the legislation of this Parliament? Is it being suggested that it, one of the tests that must be applied before a fixed penalty is uh, uh, offered to an offender 
is that they have the means to, to, to pay. Because I think there's probably a general view that uh, public order on particularly Saturday nights, Friday nights, is much served by the police not having to put, take hours out and take people back when it's perfectly clear a fixed penalty will do. Is it that narrow point of people who cannot reasonably be expected to pay? And is that an issue we as legislators no. should be looking at rather than perhaps this being a fiscal I've, I've, I've this, uh, I heard this legislation as it is at Westminster at the weekend. We had our, uh, we had our yeah. annual conference as a convener as aware at the weekend and both the, uh, the Sheriff Principal, indeed the Lord Advocate mentioned this. I'll leave the political niceties to you guys who we pay to, to decide that. Uh, it is a seriously flawed notion that justice is served by fixed penalties. If there's not enough police on the streets to handle, Greenock is not a cesspit of violence on, at the weekend. So it is a nonsense to say that law-abiding people are being best served by fiscal fines or fixed penalty or fixed penalties. Now, what? Because what happens? What? Sorry, I was always Mr. brought up McGinn. to... Sorry. Just, just continue, Mr McGinn. Thank you. Yeah. But, uh, I was always brought up, uh, Mr Stevenson, not to make faces when other people were speaking. Uh, to the, uh, Convera, yeah, the, you're doing it again. The um, fixed penalties are given... Let me give you an example. Let me give you a real example. I saw a chap recently, £875 worth of fixed penalties never been to court, £475 worth of those fixed penalties were given to him in half an hour. The man is an alcoholic, he's one of life's victims. He was enjoying, well he thought he was enjoying drinking in the street. A police car passes, and this is not a criticism of the police, I see a lot of police because I'm up at half three in the morning you know, listening to requests for search warrants for them. So I really, I live there, I know exactly what's happening. The, he, he gets a fixed penalty of £100 for drinking in the street. The same police car comes back 15 minutes later and they give him another £100 for drinking in the street because he doesn't care, he's an alcoholic. They come back 15 minutes later and the same gentleman is more than topped up when the alcohol is already in the system. So this time when the police constable gets out of the car, he decides that he's going to give them the benefit of his experience and, and is abusive to them. That then becomes breach of the peace and it's £275. So if £475 in fixed penalty fines given to an alcoholic is a good use of people's time in half an hour, uh, that's disappointing. Now on, on a, another matter that uh, I think it's important to... I should... I stop you there, Ms McQueen. Certainly. You've answered the very narrow point that Stuart Stevenson um, has brought up and, and answered it very well. And I'm going to move on. You, you've got ample opportunity to come back in, it Mr Wait, Stevenson. It's simply to I've make... made a ruling that you have ample opportunity to come back in later and continue this further. Um, a supplementary should be very direct and, and short. You will have the opportunity, Mr. Stevenson. I'm now moving on to Liam, and I'm giving you point of order. My personal integrity may have been called into question, and I just want to make clear, if my facial expression was misinterpreted as being hostile to the witness, that was not my intention or my belief. And I think it's important to say that now. Mr Stevenson, we don't have point of orders in, in committees, which I should have stopped you before you said any more, but you've said what you've said, and I'm sure we've all noted it. Liam McCarthy. No, uh, 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 no, it, it wouldn't help, Mr McEwen. Thank you very much. I think we've dealt with that point. Um, Mr McArthur. Convener, just returning to the point around um, centralised marking, which I think you were referring to, Mr McEwen, in, in reference to the, the lack of a fiscal in in Inverclyde. Um, this is a concern that's been raised with us by um, a number of witnesses that we've, um, we've heard from over the last few weeks. Um, I, and I think in, in terms of your written evidence, you, you, you point to some of those concerns about the, the, um, the, the lessening of local knowledge in terms of, of, of dealing with individual incidents. Um, could you perhaps offer the committee, or both of you perhaps offer the committee, um, a way of 
securing the benefits, I think um, that, that the centralised marking is perhaps delivered, whether in terms of administration or, or, or possibly more in terms of the, the specialism that's brought to, uh, to certain cases, with retaining that local knowledge, which it seems, I think, apparent um, has, been, has been diminished um, and perhaps under, un, undervalued. Uh, what, would, what would be the way of striking the right balance between what we have at the moment um, and, and what perhaps we've lost uh, in the move to that more centralised system? I haven't had an opportunity to speak so far to, to speak, and I'd be grateful if both members' questions and the responses could be a little more succinct, because we have a lot to cover. Yes. Mr Little. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the fundamental problem with central marking is it's central marking. Now, we all understand the constraints that every area of business and public service is under. Um, there seems to be little recognition of local issues, whether it be here or in the West. As one sheriff said to me on occasion, he says, don't you believe that I'm not aware of what the issues are? He says, I have piles of letters from the community telling me that they're unhappy with the sentencing. If I could just go back, I have one issue here from three years ago. This is an actual instance. A young man, I was told, was in custody. I said, that's fine. He's at the hospital. We don't know what the problem is. Cut a very long story short, at two o'clock in the afternoon, that young gentleman appeared before me, shackled between two officers, with two G4S officers, with two police officers facing him in case he kicked off. He'd been causing all kinds of commotion in the cell. The agent stood up, who was the court-appointed agent, and said, Your Honour, somebody's going to have to do something about this. I said, I couldn't agree more. This young man had 10 fiscal fines, two police fines, had never seen the inside of a court building. It was abundantly obvious there were mental health issues. Now, the one thing that a justice of the peace is not supposed to hear is mental health issues. It's the only thing in our guidebook that allows us to refer a case immediately from our court to a higher court, i.e. the sheriff court. We discovered that this young man had mental health issues. His mother had been trying to deal with the problems. Under the old regime, regardless of what offence he had committed, he had report, would have appeared before me, an agent would have stood up, outlined the background, and immediately a sentence would have been deferred for three weeks for a social background report, and he would be in the system. So here we had a young man sitting with a huge sum of fines and had never seen the inside of a court building. Now, Madam Chairman, I don't know if you were there when I raised the issue with the Lord Advocate on Sunday, was that? A week past Monday, a pile of paperwork was put in my desk in chambers asking if I would reduce the number of fines on an individual. It was £1,800. Going back to 2008, all fines from December 2010, as far as Greenock GP Court was concerned, had to be remitted because none of the paperwork had transferred from the old district court system to the Justice of the Peace system. I duly remitted everything prior to night 2015. There was 1,800 pounds involved. Now, Mr. McCune has outlined the type of people we're getting with this. It has become an easy marking issue. Just we don't have the, the resources to put them into court, so it's £400 fines. I have a person appears before me in whatever matter. If I find guilt or they plead guilty, I must offer a 30% discount. So people have been handed £400 fines, actual fines. Correct me, my, I was never very good at maths, but in that case then, that would be me handing down a £700 fine, which I then get down to £400 with a 30% discount. You're, you're relating this to uh, Liam MacArthur's question about yeah. central marking. And central just, marking, uh, yeah. all of this yeah. stuff, okay. at, a, at a certain level, because the resources are not there to bring any of this stuff to court, the police fines are a different issue, because they're giving them the street. 
This is somebody sitting in an office who's looking at cases at a certain level and deeming we don't have the resources to put this into court and it's been removed by. So you made, I heard you making the comment, or maybe it was Mr. Stevenson, uh, making the comment that a decision had to be made. That was this appropriate? I don't think any of that is happening. MacArthur? Just, I mean, just to be clear, it, from, from what you're saying and from your written evidence, Mr McEwen, the, the, the preference would be to return to a, a localised marking system, potentially with input, <sighs> um, specialist input in, in certain cases where, where necessary. Is that...? Absolutely. Yep, definitely. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we now have Mary followed by Rona. Convener. I suppose the earlier question I had was actually covered by Stuart Stevenson, but really it was also to look at victims and witnesses, so that wasn't really much touched on in the, in the evidence, but it was really just curious as to what the experience of witnesses um, uh, and victims is in the JP courts, and do you think that they tend to get the support and the information that they need uh, when, they, when they attend? Proving. I, th I think the answer is to a degree, yeah, you can always do better. You, can, you, you always have to be very, very aware that uh, anyone who comes to give evidence to you, it, it's, it's a pressure situation, and that applies to the police as well. It's, you know, you see young, young, inexperienced policemen come in looking extraordinarily nervous to give, to give evidence. I think the um, recent uh, changes which allow people to come in and give evidence behind screens and we work the technology from them is, is a real step forward. Um, and it's one of the many, in fairness, that step forwards that the Scottish, the Scottish government has made in recent years. It's, it's very kind of outward looking, I think, and it's looking at the, you, you're, what you're talking about, I guess, to a certain degree is the ancillary kind of knock on from the, from, from the justice system. And the Scottish government's been very good at that. Things like the Scottish Recovery Consortium, their, their notion of building smaller prisons so to keep family units close by. Uh, and I think there is a, 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 a tad more uh, humanity being shown than perhaps was shown in the past. You can always do better, but we, we do take great cognizance. If, if one, of the th one of the points that on local justice is that you'd, if, if you take a very simple, well, it's a simple case perhaps for the benefit of this discussion, if you're a gardener and you take great care of your garden and stuff like that, and someone comes on and rips your plants out, that's important to you. That's the sort of things that we see. That's important to you. So you have to be mindful that it may just be some plants to some people, but to this particular man or woman, it's their garden, it's their hobby, it's what's their home, and you have to. Bear that in mind, you have to take cognizance of that when you're dealing with it. It doesn't mean that you get the birch out, but it means that you take an appropriate sentence, as I said earlier, that, so that the individual concerned can see we care. We, we care about your quality of life. And equally, the, the individual who has caused the damage understands that, listen, cut it out. You're going to be punished. Don't be back here. So there, there's a balance. I think we're getting better at it. It's something that we spend a lot of time training on and communic communication in the court and control of the court and making sure that if a witness is being, I hesitate to use the word harassed, but perhaps put under pressure by the defence, we, we take a view in that. And, you know, if someone's asked the same question three times, we're very quick to say, listen, I got the answer the first time. And indeed, I, I emphasised it, he emphasised it the second time. I don't really need to hear it three times. The experienced justices amongst us are good at doing that, I think. Okay. Uh, no, it's, it, well, it's just that you know, we heard evidence from some other witnesses and people who dealt with people like Via, and you know, a very mixed experience there. So I'm glad to hear a bit more positivity on that front in, in terms of the JP service. If you. I think there's a way to go. Yeah. And, and I think we have to understand as well and, and the. Uh, the sheer pressure, the physical, perhaps, people feeling that if I give evidence here, my windows might come in, or you know, something like that. I think we have to be very mindful of that, and I think we are. Um, but again, that's all helped if everything, if everybody in the local area understands what the issues are and understands the different areas where windows may come in if evidence is given, that sort of thing. But we can we can do better. But I think we're we're trying hard to be better at it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, Rona, followed by Fulton. Can I again ask members to keep their questions short and the witnesses to give their answers as succinct as possible? 
Thank you, Convener. Um, it's a question to Mr McCune. Um, you're clearly not a fan of fixed penalties. And I'm I wonder if you could expand a wee bit on what your alternative would be, because I'm struggling to understand how you know, anything else would, wouldn't impact adversely on an already overworked system. Um, so maybe if you could maybe expand a wee bit on how you think that could be done. And also, um, would you support perhaps maybe a threshold on the number of fixed penalties that an individual could get, you know, get to a level of, say, five, and then, you know, it, it could be something different? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can keep this. Uh, I'll do my best, uh -huh. convener. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure about the level, to take the last part of your question first. I, I mean, I, I, I go back to my point I made earlier, and I hope that if you've not got any money, fining you £100 is not going to do you any good because you're not going to pay it. You don't have the money to pay it. You don't have the lifestyle that it would motivate you to go and pay it because you're too busy trying to perhaps get your fix for that particular day. Um, and all, all a fixed penalty does is, is encourage you to go out and, and, and steal more money so that you... So, so it's not... In, 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 they encourage criminality. They don't. They're not in, in a lot of cases. Uh, what, what Rona Mackay is saying is: there ever a place for a yeah. fixed penalty, or is your position that they are being used inappropriately because someone clearly can't pay? I think there can be places for them. Yes, but you, you, it needs a careful judgment to be made. Um, I make a point in my report about uh, people using mobile phones while they drive. If anybody thinks fixed penalties solved that, they're living in Mars, quite frankly. It doesn't happen. Just go and stand in the street corner and walk. Uh, but there are occasions where people who would be identified perhaps within the local community as not being, n not being regulars at court, then it may well have a salutary effect. Uh, you asked uh, what would the uh, alternative be. We used to have a perfectly good alternative. Um, when people would come in front of you in court, they would, if they were found guilty or pled guilty, you would then put a fine in place, commensurate with their means, and you would impose something called the alternative. And I'll be keep this very, very simple, but the alternative uh, would be seven days in prison equated to a hundred pounds. Yeah, seven days in prison equated to a hundred pound fine. Now people throw their hands up and say, "Well, we can't send people to prison for a hundred for a, for seven days." And that's absolutely correct. And we didn't, quite frankly. We did not do that. Because what would happen was, if, you, if someone appeared in front of you and said, I want to pay this up, I want to pay it up at £5 per week, OK, that's acceptable to the court, and I'm going to put the alternative on. Now, the individual knew what the alternative meant. So if they missed one payment of £5, the police would go to their door and they would go to prison. But that never happened, uh, Ms Mackay, because you weren't looking for £100 all at the same time. You were looking for a fiver. And what happened was that the family would chip in, friends would chip in, and it would be paid, and the fine repayment moved on. So that was a very suitable alternative. There was all this, you know to do that now and is it uh, the, the legislation Fixed penalties takes no cognizance at all right. of the means of the person who gets it. I see. So you can give them five or you, you can give them ten. It's taking no cognizance if, of their ability to pay. I, I still can't quite see how the court system and just in general that wouldn't be adding to the workload of people like yourselves and, and then you know a higher level if, if you did that. I mean I think that, that was perfectly appropriate then, but I think perhaps we, we need to move on from that. I, I understand what you're saying about the deficiencies of the p fixed penalty system, but um, I'm not sure that there's a viable alternative which would lessen the workload on the courts. We try and help with the efficiency question, efficiency aspect of your question, if I may. It was a one-stop shop with the old system. Now what happens is fixed penalties are dished out, they're not paid, it mounts up and mounts up. People monitor that. Or there's a fine enforcement agency that has been created by the government, staffed with people who all take salaries and all take benefits and live in, and work in buildings and, and, and incur costs, as any, any organisation does. Um, and they chase and they chase and they chase. But you're chasing people who, are, who have chaotic lifestyles. And is the point that is maybe going back to the central marking no. that... 
that um, it shouldn't have been a fixed penalty in the first place. There might have been local alternatives or referrals or, yeah, yeah. or things that could have been used to answer Rona Mackay. Is um, there any alternative to stopping this clogging up the courts? Well, or is that not the case? It does go back to central banking convener, but it also, Ms Mackay has asked me about efficiency. So, the, 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 and if you bear with me, I, I realise we're eating into time, but bear with me. The, because this is very, very important to the well-being of the people that you guys represent and my fellow citizens. The, so the fine enforcement says you can't get the money because the money's not there. And then what they do is repair it to us in court. And we get a request from them to do one of three things. We can remit the fine completely, all the fines completely, just remit them. We can give the fine enforcement agency permission to access the individual's benefits so that benefit deductions can be taken or we can bring them to court. Now, you, would, might think, you may think, well, maybe the second option is a way forward. But as part of our training, we have had people from the benefits agency come in, speak to us, and they have made it patently clear that you can remit as many applications to us as you like for people, fine enforcement agency, to try to access benefits. We know the full physical position, the financial position that these people are in. So they know about housing costs. They know about do they, is their children involved. They know they've got to feed themselves. They know exactly how much money they're getting. They know other debts they have. And the, and the answer was, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, fill your boots because you're about seventh in the list and we're never going to get to you. So the fine enforcement agency does not work. So there is an inefficiency with the system that we have today, which was not there in the old system. And the old system in involved, let me remind everyone, of a justice who is not paid, a volunteer, dealing with an issue on behalf of his, local his or her local community. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, we now move on to Fulton McGregor, followed by Alderman Mundell. Thanks, Convener. Um, Rona Mackay has actually asked my question, but... As a follow-up to that, I would just ask um, the Justice of the Peace of Witnesses, thanks very much for, for coming, um, if they believe that every offence, or more or less every offence, because you, you did say that there was there was a place for direct measures, should come to court, and do you think that would have an impact on the number of people who would um, develop criminal records um, when maybe the direct measures would have avoided that being the case. I think the, 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 my view on the fixed penalties is those very senior in the organisation tried to tell us effectively nobody should have more than three or four fixed penalties before obviously appearing in court. And of course, that is not happening because it's the easy option to take your uh, point. Oh yes. yes I see. Oh yes. Well, okay. I've got one example. I just gave you an example of yeah, eighteen. I understand that. Yeah. Um, I take your point that um, about trying to avoid criminal records for those where. There really is no great need to do that. And it's trying to get, um, the term would be restorative justice, where the person is put on some program, and that, that is being used at the moment. A lot of our court cases end up with what's called community payback order. But of course, what we find there is that the social work departments, the local authority, because they control that, they're having great problems just now in our area. I understand they've employed a few more people, but that is where, where rather than just handing fines, should there not be a matter where the fiscal service is directly referring people, particularly after they've had two or three fixed penalties, getting them straight into a referred system so that they can uh, get into a programme that gets them up out of their bed in the morning, shows them how to work, helps them organise their finances, 
So I think that would be a step forward. So we don't get this large amount of fixed penalties. What we get is the fiscal service saying, look, we need to do something with this. We can't afford the cost of bringing it into the court system, but we divert it so that the people try to get some practical help of how to organise their life. Because as Mr McEwen said, we're dealing with a lot of these people where it's chaotic lifestyles. The person who commits a traffic offence sitting around this table, we've either done it or we've not. And if we have, we get a fixed penalty, we pay it. And the matter's resolved. It's where people don't have the facility to either pay up a fine, because that's an issue, or rather than just willy-nilly, it's easy to do that, get something in place where after two or three fixed penalties, they're put into a programme that tries to help them deal with their life. And we all understand it's easy for me to sit and say that. It's a totally different matter getting that to work in the real world. So, so, McGregor, if, of, yeah. you know, if we see someone, perhaps a young person in front of us, or a, a trained justice, an experienced justice, we, we are mindful of the damage that we could maybe be doing here if we don't dispose of this correctly. Uh, it's, but the vast majority of people we see, Mr McGregor, have very, very long criminal records. Uh, and you know, we need to try to find a way of getting them out of the system and into some sort of restorative justice, as, as Mr Little has just said. And I, and I think that's what I was trying to clarify, because what I was hearing earlier, and I think, I think you, you have um, alleviated my uh, concerns with that, um, is that I actually thought at one point you were saying that you know almost everybody should come to some form of court. I now don't believe in what I've heard that, that, that you are indeed saying that. And um, that of course, there is, a, there is restorative options uh, there and that they are used and perhaps the local knowledge thinking. And of course, a, a community payback order, uh, to be on a community payback order, does, does involve being convicted of an offence. So if you're on a community payback order, you would, you would in turn have a... A criminal record, so I, I think I'm kind of happy to leave it there. Thank you We've much. really spent a lot of time talking about fiscal fines and fixed penalties, etc. There's um, very important issues in the Scottish Justice Association's um, presentations, which uh, written evidence, which I hope we can cover. Oliver Mundell. Yeah, you'll be pleased, convener, because I was hoping to move away from fixed penalties and look at some of the other issues. So. Uh, the first question was around uh, readiness for trial. It's, it's something that's come up uh, in some of our other evidence uh, sessions, and I think it's touched upon briefly in some of the written submissions. But there just seems to be a general sense that there are uh, cases uh, coming before courts where uh, they're, they're just simply not ready. Is that something that you've experienced? Let me begin by saying uh, neither Mr Little nor I speak on behalf of the... Uh, SGA, they were given the opportunity to be here and I believe uh, for reasons that I won't go into at the moment, um, they decided to withdraw their, their representative. We made that clear at the beginning yeah. that we understand you here in the yeah. pe personal capacity, yeah. but we did hope that yeah, no, you'd be able to speak absolutely. to some of the issues that were raised in the association's written yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 So let, me on let me begin by saying that no one, this is not a none of this is a criticism of the fiscals. I've been around here for 25 years doing this. And in that time, the fiscal service are hardworking, dedicated people. They are pushing water up a hill just now. There's so few of them. But yes, you can go into court, and it can be a wee bit uh, disorganised because of this, you know, the uh, the work that each fiscal has to take on. They've got to get themselves to Pais from Paisley to Greenock to Kilmarnock, whatever. They have to. Uh, they have to get organised, they have to talk to defence uh, solicitors to hear pleas, change of pleas, all that kind of stuff. So yes, things can be, things can be and are being delayed, cases are being delayed, being brought to court, uh, and the fiscals are under huge pressure because there's not enough of them. So that it, and that delays the process uh, further because they will ask for a continuation, um, and it's then for the justice to decide if he grants that continuation or not. But yes, it, gets, it's, it is a problem for the fiscals as well, I would contend. Yep. Does that help? Does that answer your... Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I just wondered, has it got considerably worse? Oh, absolutely. Um, and yeah. given your 25 
years' experience, it, can you identify a point or a sort of time scale in which it's the, changed? I think when we moved to the Scottish Court Service, I think that the, this, the District Court would highlight that would be the, the turning point. I think that um, there was a, a real, I think it's important that we're all professional, but I think there's been a real effort to uh, perhaps over-professionalise the task with less resources. Um, Okay. I would think round about then. I mean, you really do see people under stress that fiscals are under. They are you, in a bad time. Elsewhere in your own evidence, you talk about a lack of experience uh, resulting in delays around whether or not to accept pleas. Again, that's something that we've heard from other witnesses at the committee. Do you think there's a definite sense in which that's the case? I mean, absolutely. And um, it comes about, and I would contend, because... Um, if you're a young person today coming out of university with a law degree, uh, I think it's fair to say the best thing the fiscal service can offer you by way of a career is a three-month contract. So you're not going to hang around too long. You're not, that may not be the most attractive option to you. you. It's like everything else. When you start off as a justice of the peace, you're not very good at it. Uh, you, you may get all you tick all the boxes, but you know the experience counts for a lot. It's likewise with uh, a PF, um, ex experience counts for a lot. So when new people come in on three months contract, there's a churn. Um, there's no continuation of employment, continuity of employment. Um, so yeah, any, you know that's the sort of thing that plays plays its part. Yeah, and sorry, some other uh, witnesses have suggested there's almost a sort of fear of making the wrong decision. Um, and that you know people can't get in touch with a superior to clear a decision in time. They, they either can't contact that person or don't feel able to uh, for various reasons. Do you think? Do you think there's a, a truth to that? It's very true. It's, um, I've seen it. It's absolutely certain. You're, you're giving an inexperienced uh, fiscal a decision to make that they have no experience or training in making, uh, and they do frankly the right thing you know it would be the wrong thing for the fiscal to do would be to try to make a decision that's not capable of me he or she's not capable of making but what they do is try to get a hold of someone more uh, more experienced there's just not enough of them around i've seen it it's absolutely it's happening okay um and uh, finally you mentioned as well that there's a number of cases that end up being time barred because they're not being seen in time do you think that that's i i understand obviously the sort of different levels but do you think that that's something that's happening across the board, uh, or is it, you know, mainly at the, the the JP end of things where, you know, the cases are being time barred? I think um, I, I'm not. I don't know what the actual figures are, but I have had, uh, as is Mr. Little, I'm sure, had experiences where cases are time barred and time barred, and they just have to have to fall, uh, or if they are to be continued on that day because all the information is not there to prosecute them on that day, it goes out with the time bar. Um, I think it would be a brave fiscal who uh, time barred a case in a sheriff court uh, to a lot more weight than we do. Um, but it is going on, Mr Mundell. Um, I'm not saying that we see lots, hundreds of them, but it is going on. Cases do fall because they're time barred because the fiscals don't have the, uh, the facility the resources to handle them within the, the time limit. You find this particularly in cited courts, where the term not called will come up with some degree of regularity. And as you appreciate, a lot of them, depends when, whether they use the word serious or not, but uh, mobile phone switch, they want to prosecute, but because it hasn't got down the chain fast enough, they suddenly find they're sitting there with something and you can see them working out the dates to make sure that they've got it's out with the six months and it's time barred. Thank you. If I, I could just maybe ask you a little bit about something that was in the SGA report that highlighted the issue with regard to the lack of administrative support for fiscals and perhaps that resulting in, um, I think, was it Mr McEwen's um, presentation? where people may even hand in something and it doesn't actually appear um, at the end of the day when the, the fiscal is presenting the case. Have I got that right? Recognise that from my own... Not from your... The SGA certainly said a lack of administrative support was adding to the, the churn um, in their 
um, in their submission. And I think the, the assumption there was that um, procurative fiscal dispute could sometimes indicate readiness for trial, um, which was based on an expectation rather than fact. I understand the point now. Yeah. Convener, yeah. Uh, yeah. What happens, what, I, I believe the SGA would be talking about, there is something we all experience, it's almost business as usual, where there is um, responsibility on the fiscal to give what we call disclosure to the defence, that is that the, uh, the PF must, the prosecution service must give all the evidence and all the contacts for the evidence to the defence to allow the defence to recognise the, the witnesses against their client and there are delays caused because uh, disclosure has not been made. And that can be CCTV footage, uh, which seems to be the favourite one. Uh, it mostly, it can, yes, so yes, that does take place. And that would be, I guess, when I think about it, uh, backup staff to the fiscals. There was only one final question I think we hadn't really covered, and you mentioned that you, you deal with domestic cases, domestic behaviour cases, almost breach of the peace. Um, in your experience, we've heard from other witnesses that maybe they are going to trial when there is an insufficiency of evidence. Is that an issue in the, the justice of the peace court? We used to deal with these in previous years, and the decision was taken at right, a point in time that uh, domestic abuse cases would all go to the sheriff, and we heard at the weekend they're talking about bringing back the lesser end to our court. Um, but um, no, we, we don't haven't really seen anything much of that. Um, it's been more, I think, that has been the sheriffs who have been dealing with that matter in okay. recent years. Okay, and Ms McEwen, nothing to add to that? No. No, I mean, I think John's covered that. It, um, I, I, no, I tend not to see a lot of that, to be honest. If there are any further questions, it just remains to, for me to, to thank both witnesses very, very much. Um, it's been hugely valuable to have your contribution to this debate as sitting justices in the court, seeing on a daily basis what goes on. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I promise not to keep you back. Uh -huh. My attendance here has caused uh, a lot of... Uh, I hesitate to say concern, but interest amongst the hierarchy. My sheriff principal and indeed the Lord Advocate himself mentioned it to me on Sunday that I was coming here. And in conversation with the Lord Advocate uh, about the issues that we've discussed today and fixed penalties and, and, and so forth, he mentioned a figure. But the figure's very low, he said to me, and this is an extremely capable man, as you all know. And I said to him, James, I don't recognise those figures. They're way, way low. He said, no, no, I'm sure. I said, they're not. They're, you're, you're, those figures are low now. And he was talking about something like 9,000 to date fixed penalties that had, uh, that had ended up in court. When he mentioned that from the dais as he was speaking to the audience, there was uproar, absolute uproar. And he was accompanied by uh, Justin Farrell from the PF service. Um, and he was asked, Justin was asked, where did he get the figures from? So the figure and the figures that are being bandied around by sheriff principals, a Lord Advocate, given to them by their officials, date from 2006 to 2007. So the Lord Advocate and others were placed in a position where they were trying to argue a case with statistics that were almost well, they are in fact 10 years old. So. Uh, and I think it's very important. Yeah. I made okay. the case is that people get out of their silos, stop being defensive, and let's try to offer a justice system that actually works for everyone. Well, I think the, the point about fixed penalties and your concerns have been well noted and um, well covered today. And I thank you both very much for your appearance before us. Can we have a now a uh, brief suspension to allow for a change of witnesses?
Well, welcome uh, to the committee today. Our second panel, who is Bernard Higgins, Assistant Chief Constable for Operations and Justice, and Chief Superintendent Gary McEwen, Divisional Commander, Criminal Justice Service Division, Police Scotland, and Eric McQueen, Chief Executive, and Tim Barraclough, Chief Development and Innovation Officer with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Quest, uh, ser services. Uh, you're all very welcome, gentlemen. And I thank you for your written evidence, which is, is also uh, always very much appreciated by the, the committee to have these written submissions. So I'll move straight now. Um, there's a limited time, and um, if both questioners and um, respondents could be as uh, concise as possible, that would really be appreciated. I'm going to start with Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to ask Go questions on. particularly Go to um, Police Scotland. Uh, we've had a number of uh, witnesses during the inquiry who have talked about the way in which domestic abuse cases are held and there have been claims made that um, the police are arresting too many cases and also that when cases are going to court they are going with insufficient evidence and um, the second point has been refuted by uh, the procurator fiscal service um, in terms of police scotland's uh, role there have been a figure put around that 50% uh, of cases end up in court. Um, and this has been used as justification for arguing that some cases are inappropriately, uh, have inappropriate police involvement. Um, last week, Marcia Scott from Scottish Women's Aid um, described the situ situation. And Marcia said that it is a big mistake to assume that because someone was lifted and not prosecuted, that there wasn't a very good argument in terms of safety for lifting that guy for a short period of time. I was wondering if the officers here today could comment on the role of Police Scotland, the approach that has been taken towards domestic abuse, and some more explanation of the 50% figure that has been banded about recently. Uh, good morning, uh, members. I'm happy to take that question. Uh, firstly, I would want to say that Police Scotland for many years now has been committed with a, a number of partners to tackle domestic abuse uh, and to support the most vulnerable in our communities. Uh, and it's true to say that, yes, in, in years we have taken a very robust approach to dealing with domestic abuse offenders, and that's in uh, conjunction with the, the Lord Advocate's guidelines in terms of, of how we should actually um, approach that. In terms of... <coughs> um, insufficient evidence there is a clear distinction in, in the role of the police and the crown uh, prosecutors you know so we might have a sufficiency to arrest but for for reasons that for the crown office they might decide not to prosecute but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean to say that people are getting arrested for no good reason far from it uh, and i guess um, uh, with the convener's indulgence i'll give you some figures which which may put it into context um, so for the the period of last year 2015 to 2016, the police dealt with 58,000 domestic incidents, um, of which 51% uh, or 29,000 reported or uh, were recorded as criminal. Um, now, out of those 29,000 people, persons that were arrested, um, 34,000 charges were subsequently libelled against individuals. You know, so one person might have had multiple charges. Uh, and at the last reckoning, that led to an 80% conviction rate. So by any stretch, an 80% conviction rate is pretty high. Um, having 58,000 uh, domestic incidents and you know, dealing criminally with about 51% of them shows that there is absolutely an appropriate and proportionate response to, to police when we call to it. So the, the notion that every time you're called to a, a domestic incident, that we have to arrest somebody is simply not the case. The officers will go to each individual circumstance, make a professional assessment of whether or not, firstly, a criminal uh, act has happened, because lots of times we are called to domestic incidents where there is no criminality. Um, and if there is criminality, they will investigate that as they would any other crime, and if there's a sufficiency, they will arrest. The prosecutorial decision then rests with the, the procurator fiscal. Um, that's very helpful. Um, thank you. Do you recognise is that domestic abuse is still a hugely unreported crime? Is that the experience that Police Scotland would have in regards to that? And that have there been issues with um, 
with a, the cultural shift that has been necessary within Police Scotland and possibly other bodies and authorities who uh, deal with domestic abuse crimes uh, to recognise the severity of the crime and the importance that the Scottish Parliament and the country put on recognising it as a serious crime? Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, I, I can't recall off the, the top of my head, but I, I do remember at one occasion, I think the the statistic was somewhere between 15 and 20 times a person will be a victim of domestic abuse before they actually report it to the police. Now, I may, I may be incorrect with that, but I, I do recall, and this was a number of years ago when I, I first read it, that that struck me as a very high figure, that somebody was a, a repeat victim of, of some form of domestic abuse and generally reached that point where they could no longer, no longer take it before they involved the police. So many years ago, um, the, the, the police services recognised that uh, and working with the Lord Advocates, uh, uh, um, Advocacy for Victims, um, we really refocused um, our approach to domestic abuse to make it a victim-centred approach. And part of that victim centre is to remove the offender um, from putting that individual in greater risk and to, and to greater harm. So yes, absolutely, as well as wrapping around a, a care package around the victim, Part of the strategy was to remove the offender from that environment. Um, thank you for that clear statement, because I have been concerned about the way in which some of this debate has been conducted in recent weeks, uh, arising from the committee inquiry, and I'm pleased to hear the strong uh, support from Police Scotland on this issue. We have Rona Mackay. Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, just, just to clarify, following up, before I ask my main question from, from Claire's point, is it accurate to say then that Police Scotland operate a zero tolerance approach to domestic abuse? If there is, uh, at this moment in time, if there's a sufficiency uh, to arrest, then we will arrest. And that's the agreed uh, protocol between ourselves, uh, Crown Office and Lord Advocate. Thank you. Um, can I ask then, um, on a separate issue, um, if Police Scotland are satisfied that the Crown Office have the sufficient resources and the skill um, to successfully prosecute the, the complex crimes that we're seeing today, like cybercrime, corporate fraud, human trafficking, etc. Um, do you feel that um, this has been adequately dealt with and do you foresee any problems with ongoing increase in that side of things? I, mean, I, th I think it's a, a really valid question, ma'am. Um, you know, the, the it's not just the Crown Office, it's the, the nature of the criminal justice um, environment that we all have to adapt to the changing nature of crime. You know, so for within Police Scotland, we've got a cyber crime unit, we've got bespoke units that, that deal with domestic abuse, sexual crime, um, the terrorist threat is very high on our agenda. Uh, and like uh, other partners, uh, my understanding is Crown Office has reorganised to reflect that. So we now have specialist prosecutors um, that will look at homicide, cyber crime, sexual abuse. We have, uh, for many years, had uh, specialist football um, prosecutors. So I would, I would say, from my perspective, that the, the crown do appear to be um, reacting to the changing environment and restructuring to, to meet that demand. Thank you. That's encouraging to you. Okay, John Finney, followed by Liam McArthur. Mr Higgins, thank you for, for your evidence. The, the Police Scotland have been rightly pleased for, for their approach to um, domestic uh, violence. And one aspect in particular is the investigation of historic um, um, cases. C can you explain the relationship between an individual being arrested, the requirement for them to appear at court, and the inquiries that Police Scotland would undertake to understand if this is a pattern of behaviour that's taken place with um, previous partners or other relationships, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Finney. Um, sadly, it's not an uncommon scenario you've painted there. Um, we do have a number of individuals um, who will um, identify and pick on vulnerable and weak people, and they will do it over um, sometimes decades, uh, and not only uh, a single victim, it could be several. Uh, for that reason, the, the force has set up its uh, domestic abuse task force, um, and that supports the divisional domestic abuse units that we have, where our domestic abuse task force takes on um, what you would call the high-end offenders who will have a, a, a repeated behaviour where they will go out and target individuals over many years. So when uh, we arrest that particular individual, there will then be a retrospective uh, inquiry where we will identify potential previous partners and go and speak to those individuals to see if they were a, a victim as well. Um, it is very time-consuming. 
um, it is a very sensitive and difficult inquiry, but very much worthwhile. Yeah, it was to try and understand the relationship between that, that arrest, so an individual's arrested, say, for the first time. What would trigger, and given what my colleague Claire said about the level of anticipated under-reporting that there is, what would trigger that historic abuse in inquiry, and would that be in conjunction with the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service? Um, yeah, we would uh, put a, a guidance note to Crown Office uh, to say that whilst this is the initial case, our belief is that th this could p potentially spread. You know, uh, and it's very basic things like, you know, if, the, if it's a fresh relationship, they've only been in a relationship for six months, um, or, uh, you know, during the disclosure interview, the victim discloses that they believe that previous partners have, have been subjected to this sort of, of behaviour, and that can trigger it. Uh, clearly, if it's a 20-year you know, marriage, the, the actual historical inquiry might be over that, the length of that marriage. So it really depends on the circumstances. What, what is the catalyst for us to take that, uh, that next step? Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Liam MacArthur, followed by Oliver Mundell. Uh, thanks, Convener. I, I think we've heard quite rightly about the, the seriousness with which um, these cases are, are taken, partly, I think, because of the, the acknowledged under-reporting, you know, the figures you talked about in terms of the number of potential um, incidents before uh, there is an initial complaint um, made, the ins historical dimension to this as well. But I, I'm struggling to reconcile the evidence you've given us this morning with the evidence that we heard from the Scottish Police Federation um, a, a week or so ago, where um, I think the acceptance of the strategy of zero tolerance wasn't called into dispute. I think what was being suggested was that there was effectively um, zero discretion for police officers um, to, to exercise their judgment in, in particular circumstances. Can you perhaps help me to, to reconcile what we heard from Scottish Police Federation on behalf, presumably, of their members mm -hmm. and the perspective they had, which echoed, I suppose, what we were hearing from the bar associations as well, with, with what you set out um, uh, this morning? I'll, I'll try, um, because it, it's not for me to speak on behalf of the, the Scottish no. Police Federation. I, I guess, sir, I can only reiterate the Police Scotland position. Uh, bearing in mind that 49 per cent of domestic incidents we deal with are non-criminal and are resolved at that time, um, and the 51% that are criminal, um, again, the, the same um, threshold in terms of evidence has to be met before we can actually arrest an individual. Because once we take that individual away from the scene, they're then taken to a custody office where an independent officer, normally of sergeant rank, will assess the evidence to satisfy him or herself that there is a sufficiency of evidence before they will accept that individual into custody. Um, and then, before we decide whether or not to keep the individual in custody, there's that, again, that assessment of the evidence before it's decided what, what to do with the, the person. So I can only reiterate what I've said. Um, the, 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 the conviction rate, which I uh, spoke about early, tends to suggest to me that those cases are reported to Crown, are strongly evidenced, and the 80% the conviction rate tends to support that. Uh, interestingly, um, I had a look at uh, the, the cases aren't proceeded on, and bearing in mind, you, you, it's not again, it's not for me to speak on behalf of Crown, but Crown might take a decision not to proceed, not because of a, a lack of evidence, but because of a whole range of other factors. But currently, we're sitting at about 2.5% of cases reported to Crown aren't proceeded on, which again, to me, suggests that there, the people we are reporting, there is more than a sufficiency of evidence. Given what you're saying, and given what we heard from Callum Steele the other week and indeed the, the bar associations. Um, have you en endeavoured to, to have further conversations with them about what appears to be um, quite a, 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 deviance and a deviation in terms of, of perception of how the, the current system is, is working? I mean, we speak regularly with the Federation. Um, any concerns, are not just the Federation, all staff associations, the Unison uh, Association of Scottish Superintendents, and any concerns that they flag up to us then we, we speak about it and we go and have a look. Um, now, if uh, any member of the Federation wishes to draw particular cases which they feel have not met the threshold or were dealt with inappropriately, I'm more than happy to, to uh, look at that individually. Um, as, as just now, none have been flagged to me, so I can't really comment. Okay. Thank you. I could just um, probe that a little bit more. Not only did Callum Steele, when he presented here last week, say uh, when uh, a report comes in, mm then 
one of the um, two involved will leave in handcuffs. We've also heard from defence agents that it's a matter of who reports it first as to which one of them will leave in handcuffs. Is that not something you recognise? I think that's uh, with respect to Callum and the Bar Association oversimplistic. You know, um, to say that every time our officers go to a house, they're predisposed to say, right, well, somebody's leaving here in handcuffs. It just doesn't... I, I don't see that, convener, uh, and the figures that have articulated to you, 49% of the time it's the police officers that leave the locus and the two people remain behind. Um, again, yes, if there is criminality, then we have a, a duty to investigate that, and if the threshold is made, then um, the person will be arrested. Again, it's not unusual for both individuals to be arrested um, if there is evidence of criminality on both sides. Uh, and again, uh, Chief Superintendent McEwen's staff will then take a, an informed decision about whether we keep both the individuals in custody or not. You know, so, for example, if you lock up a husband and, and wife and they have children, then there's obvious carer responsibilities there, and it might well be that the, the balanced proportionate decision is to release one of the parents um, to appear at court the following day or a day to be determined to allow them to, to undertake their caring um, um, responsibilities. And I highlight that just to say this is a really complex area. It's not as simple as saying police officers will turn up, walk down the garden path and half an hour later walk back up the garden path with somebody in, in handcuffs. You know, it's, it's more complex than that. Well, perhaps if I could maybe develop that a little bit further, we've had the written submission. Um, communication has been a concurring, incurring theme through Police Scotland, um, maybe a, a lack of sufficient communication between rank and file officers and senior members of, um, of the police force. And I was very struck by the the difference in the submission from the Scottish Police Federation and your submission, which um, didn't, uh, I think, maybe move us on so much forward. And I'm wondering, is there a communication issue here about the police officers that are regularly attending these incidents and the hierarchy? Um, if we go right, right back to uh, an initial incident, as well as the, the review by the, the custody sergeant, um, the shift supervisor, the shift inspector will, supervise, will review that incident before they go off duty. Um, the following day at the, the morning management meeting, the area commander uh, will review it. Uh, the following uh, that, if there's any issues, the divisional commander will do it. So there's a lot of check and balances right the way through uh, any domestic incident. In terms of, of um, uh, contact with the staff association. We have uh, regular formal and informal meetings with them. So there is that uh, opportunity to exchange views uh, in a frank and forthright manner, and that happens quite frequently. Um, we are always never going to uh, agree on every, on every aspect um, of that. There, there's no question. The, the role of the staff association is to represent the views of their members, that's absolutely correct. The role of the, the executive is to look at the best interests of Police Scotland and the, the communities of Scotland and make sure that we are delivering uh, the most effective, efficient police service we can. Uh, sometimes there's a rub in, in both, both aims, but the, the, I guess to answer your question, there are clear lines of communication um, which are, are open at both ends between ourselves and the staff associations. And in terms of checks and balances, every domestic incident off the top of my head is probably reviewed about three or four times. Right in the communication, I can bring Mr McQueen into, um, into the, the discussion. Can I ask you about communication within the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service and in the operation of daily business in the courts? So, sorry, in what actual respect? I'm are you happy it's working effectively? Um, I notice you've got strategic working high level, but equally we've had um, numerous people telling us that there's a, a premium um, number uh, which they phone, which they are kept on um, the line for a considerable amount of time. Yeah, I th I think that's but that all impinges sorry. on the working of the court. And if we are to get any answers about this, I believe it's you, Mr. McQueen, that are Yeah, I think actually the, the issue about communications of the premium rate, I think, was more directed to the Crown Office. That's, that's not within the, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. I think this was the issue about um, bar associations trying to make contact with their fiscal, which is the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, not the, 
Scottish Court Service. Like, well, perhaps you could yeah, comment you want, if, if you a want. little bit more on the joint operated system, a strategically, uh, strategic working at a high level. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a range of, of, of different levels that we try to operate within the court service to make sure there's good communications across all of the justice organisations. First of all, we sit as a key member of the Justice Board, along with Police Scotland, um, Crown Office, Scottish Government, um, Legal Aid Board, Prison Service, and others within the ju justice area, to really try to do some of this sort of forward planning in terms of the emerging issues that are coming up. So how in the future are we going to deal with different types of business, whether it be increased sexual offending, uh, whether it be cyber crime, and we, we start to use that as part of our, our planning mechanism. We use it as part of discussions to go into spending reviews in terms of trying to work out where the, the pressures are on the system and how we best collectively use resources to, to address what we see being the, the future vision of justice. Very importantly, we extend that very much throughout the whole criminal justice boards. So within the, the six sheriffdoms, we now have six criminal justice boards, one for each sheriffdom, we brought that down from 11, and that brings together the main justice organisations within that sheriffdom. We do the planning on a day-by-day -day and a week-by-week -week basis um, about the organisation of business, about the efficiency of the court programming, and about any adjustments that might need to be made at a, at a local level. So as far as we're concerned, that tries to work very, very coherently across the whole organisation from the perhaps what you might class as the high level strategic plans down to the, the operational issues on a day-to-day -day basis and the programme of the courts. And it's that very strong relationship, particularly at a local level, um, that actually makes the courts operate effectively. So it's the role played by the Sheriff Principal, um, by the local fiscal, by the local bar association to, to jointly discuss the business at their court level. Uh, we did hear at submissions from um, some witnesses that defence agents weren't on the board, is, is, is that the case in some um, sheriffdoms or all sheriffdoms? Yeah, the, the defence agents aren't on the local criminal justice board, but they take part in discussions within the local court. So there's- Be on the, the board given they've got a day-to-day -day knowledge on- Yeah, I mean, that's uh, really a decision for sheriff principals and they, they, they chair the local criminal justice board. And the view taken is that the preference at this stage is not to have the defence agents on it. Now, there will be some occasions where defence agents are invited along and there will be specific sessions and discussions take place. But as a, a routine member, essentially, this is the authorities that are tasked by government um, for disposing of court business. So there's the local boards and then there's the high level one that you've just talked about yes. and they're not represented in either. They're not represented in either, but we do have regular discussions, particularly with the Law Society. In fact, we met with them um, just a short number of days ago, to talk about our shared thoughts about the future of planning for justice. Wouldn't it be better the if they're on the boards? Is there any reason why they shouldn't be on the board? I think the idea of the board is to make sure it's the, the, it's the organisations that have got the authority and the responsibility for the delivery of that part of business. That's, I say that's not to say at all that we don't involve them. There's some excellent work that maybe we can come back to in terms of what we've been leading on evidence and procedure, we were trying to develop a new way for criminal justice in the future. And the, both the Law Society and the faculty are full members of that group and have made a very valuable contribution. So where the timing is right for both organisations, then there's no doubt um, that we actually come together to share thinking on that. Oliver Mundell, followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you. I, I want to start um, with ACC uh, Higgins. It was just to ask um, one of the sort of things that sort of picked up on but haven't really focused on was the amount of time uh, police witnesses spend in the court. Is that a problem you're aware of where cases are, are not going ahead or uh, police witnesses end up not being, being needed? Um, <clears throat> we've tried to reduce the number of, of police witnesses. We've worked uh, closely with Crown Office in this respect. I mean, I'm in the police 28 years. Uh, and in 28 years, this has been a, a recurring debate about uh, how often and how many witnesses need to be need to be cited. I have to say, in recent years, there's been uh, fantastic work done to reduce the level. Uh, part of that is because we've put police officers in to, to work with the uh, Crown Office at various locations, and they can identify when, you know, what what level of, of witness is required. Um, we have the uh, witness scheduler, which we now share with the uh, Crown Office in terms of officer availability. And in September of this year, I put out some guidance um, to officers, uh, essentially saying um, you don't need to include everybody in a witness list uh, and giving some examples of what 
uh, somebody who might be involved in a case but is not necessarily a relevant witness, um, just to re reduce the, the number of, uh, of number of people that appear in a witness sheet. There are still a large number of cases that look like they're going to go ahead and then at the last minute don't because of the absence of uh, other information uh, and therefore, you know, despite being scheduled or having reduced it or done the best you can, there are still officers spending, you know, a large number of days in court yeah. where they never get called uh, to I, give evidence. Uh, that, that's almost inevitable that, that uh, trials will fail to start for a variety of reasons. So often it will be a legal debate, often it will be because uh, a witness hasn't turned up. In terms of actual figures, uh, I don't actually have any to hand. Um, I'll maybe ask uh, my colleague, Chief Superintendent McEwen, if he's got anything further to add to that. Yeah, I can add a wee bit more value. I mean, the witness scheduler that ACC talks about uh, is really, it's a web-based application, and that has absolutely made a, a huge difference around the number of police officers that are required. In most parts of the country now, there is a one-hour or a two-hour standby, so officers are enabled there to do paperwork back in the office or actually out in patrol, and then they get a two-hour standby, and the expectation is they then make it in the court within that two hour period, which is easily achievable in most areas by some of the geographical areas. We've noticed uh, in recent months, some of the savings as a consequence of the, the witness scheduler across the reduction in police officer over time has been significant. And that really is a, a really first class example around some of the, the good collaboration between the court service and the Crown Office and the police to, to make it more efficient. Do you think you'd be in a position to provide sort of any of the statistics around that, uh, or um, sort of some of the sort of numbers? I think it would just be of interest. Yeah, uh, so we'll, we'll take Can action, and we'll formally write to to the committee. Okay. okay. Um, and my second question was uh, more for for Mr. McQueen around the uh, case management and programming, because I think across all the, the witnesses we've spoke to uh, so far, that there does seem to be a, a recognition that things aren't working perfectly on the ground. And I know it's difficult uh, to schedule proceedings in court and things change and, and, and all of the rest of it, but there seemed to be a sense in which the uh, fiscals themselves weren't, as, didn't, have this, didn't have sufficient resources to properly uh, and fully manage the case burden and that that was having knock-on impacts to, to scheduling within the courts themselves. Is that something you'd recognise? Um, there's maybe a few things I'll just try to say that just to try to put in a, in a bit context, which, which hopefully the, the committee will be helpful. And maybe also just come back to talk about some of the issues that you were just asking Police Scotland about, about witness attendance. I think we, we recognise, and certainly the previous Justice Committee recognised, that the, the world has changed in terms of the type of crime that is coming into the court system. So there has been a, a significant increase in domestic abuse now as the, the policy is more consistent across the whole of Scotland. And there has been a significant increase in terms of sexual offending, child abuse, historic child abuse. So they, the types of cases now are, are very different to perhaps what they were five or six years ago. And that brings on complexity because that means that there are many more cases that now go to trial. These cases will be inevitably less likely to plead guilty at an earlier stage. And also the cases because of their complexity actually take longer to run. So the issues round about the programming become quite complex. We also still work in a, in a system which the, the Lord President has decided as, as a system that operates within the Victorian age um, of where we have a, a very antiquated way of how we bring cases forward. So in last year, for example, there were something in the region of 52,500 cases um, which got set down for trial, properly called for trial on the first the first calling for only 9,000 trials to proceed. Now, that meant at the very start, something in the region of 460,000 witnesses, including police witnesses across Scotland, were cited to come to court for a figure of probably less than 100,000 witnesses that ever gave evidence, evidence at the system. So the, the system, in terms of the way it's, it's designed and the way it operates at the moment, actually has a significant number of efficiencies in it. And I think part of the, the difficulty at the moment is that all the organisations are trying to work as best they can within these efficiencies, but, but actually they are constraints. So on a, a normal day in terms of how businesses progress into the court, um, when, a, 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 when cases first call and we have a trial diet in 16 weeks' time, we will allocate something in the region to eight to 10 cases to that particular trial diet. 
fairly safe in the knowledge that before the case comes to trial, then four or five of those cases will have dropped out, um, either because there will be a change in terms of evidence or there will be a, um, a guilty plea will have been preceded. So on the actual day of trial, we will have something in the region of about four to five cases down for that trial. It's likely that one of those cases will either be not called or deserted for various reasons to do it with evidence. Um, it's likely to be that one of those cases will be adjourned um, because either Crown or essential defence witnesses didn't appear. And it's likely that probably only one or two of those cases will actually to proceed to trial. So quite inevitably, there's going to be a significant impact on witnesses, both police witnesses and civilian witnesses, who have been cited to court over a long period of time with actually relatively flew by comparison given evidence. And I say that's some of the that's some of the context that we work with and some of the challenges we are trying to solve. Some of the areas that we're looking to address that is work that we have been doing in terms of what would a reformed justice system look like. Um, so we have published two reports and we're now working collaboratively with the Justice Board to try to look at a very different model for how we manage business in the future. A type of model that would see substantially less people come into court. Um, substantially less procedural hearings. Um, when I mean substantially less, I'm talking a figure over 100,000, potentially 150,000 less procedural hearings, and a situation where we would only be setting trials once we knew a trial was required. And again, I think in some of the earlier um, questions and evidence sessions, there's been discussion about earlier pre-recording of evidence and why a trial is set at the very early stage. Our view is that trials should not be set until it's known that a trial is the only way of resolving the issue, that any evidence that can be agreed has been agreed, and that the only witnesses cited to court are the essential witnesses required for that. And we genuinely believe that could free up something in the region of about 300,000 witnesses that are currently cited, in our view, are necessarily to court because they actually aren't required to give evidence in those cases. And would you accept that that's something that's got worse in a sense with a lack of or a perceived lack of resources within uh, the, the the crown office itself and the fiscal service no I, I don't think it's i don't think it's got worse at all i mean i, I think it's been a, a feature of the justice system for for many years now so um, it was a feature of the justice system that you know the, the mckinnis summary justice reform has tried to address um, i think what we have seen is is marginal improvement in some areas over different parts of the years what we are saying now is there needs to be a, a fundamental different look um, as to how we could actually process business. Now, in terms of the actual resources... So can I... No, yeah, can I yeah. Yeah, ideally, there should be um, not these eight cases unless they're all ready to go, but yeah. the evidence we've heard is that they're there and they're being presented. If they're not being presented, then they'll be time-barred. And so, you know, it's the delays in the courts that yeah, I mean, I wasn't, are, are, are I'm, making yeah. um, fiscals come forward okay, with I wasn't these cases, sure which we know are, are not prepared and are going down Some of the evidence you heard this morning was time bars. There are no time bars on trials in the... Oh, well, they the, will fall if the, they haven't sorry. been held <coughs> within the appropriate time. Um, not within the JP and Sheriff Court. The only time bars that would apply to those particular cases once they reach trial stage. Do you recognise that, that, that statement cases. that there are targets and um, they're not being met and that's why... You know, a, not, not a, a large number of cases are being brought with absolutely no prospect of being heard. We heard that from the FTA uh, union and we heard that from the other union. So is that something you dispute? It's not something I really I, I see or recognise at all. So, I mean, there are no time bars in terms of cases coming. So a, so a case wouldn't be dropped for a, a time bar at a trial stage with either the sheriff or the, the GP courts. I, I thought that in relation to um, speeding offences, there were some or driving offences, there were statutory limits and that, or sort of recognised limits where if a case hadn't reached court, you know, within a, a set amount of time. Yes, I think this is a pre-service by the police at that initial stage. Once, I, I, don't, I don't know that it is. I, I once the case actually comes into the court, yeah. it's reached trial stage. No, no, not, not if the point. trial doesn't go ahead. And I think that was the point that was being made. I think there are a number of trials which are ready to go ahead and don't actually start on time because there isn't a slot in which they can be scheduled. I yeah, think and as I say, and, on, and, and on that, a, that, that, that is where cases are being time barred. Yeah, on, on, a, on a day by day basis, a, a, a typical trial court, that's, that's very much what I've just tried to describe to you. Not that cases are, are getting put out by any attention at all because they're time barred. Um, well, by if, the there's fact not a schedule, if there's not a scheduled slot for a case to start before it exceeds you know, a, a time limit, then 
what, what, what would you say happens to that? The, the Probably case what just, we're referring to, Mr. McCune, if I may, is the 140-day rule, the length of time somebody can be held in, in custody before it comes to court. Yeah, I mean, that applies in, in solemn cases, yes. which was not what well, the GPs were, were discussing this morning. Well, that's that's where we were hearing um, that there's there's various um, rules that have to be applied with them. Okay. There's a, a build yeah. up to make sure these yeah. are met. Can, can we come back to that just in a second because that's a, the time bars are, are a slightly separate issue. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are there are cases for which first uh, part of a trial has got to take place within a set time period, or else the trial doesn't proceed. Is that am I correct in that uh, understanding? It's correct in terms of custody trials. Yep, so but, but, but so not in terms of, you know, some motoring offences or some... No, the, 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 there's two differences. One's is the, one's is the, there's the process for summary crime and, and the process for solemn crime. Yep. Yep, and in solemn crime, there are time bars that will apply. Um, and in the vast majority of cases, those time bars will be extended and we can, we can come back and discuss that. In case of summary criminal business, when the case comes to trial, if the case cannot be completed, the case will just simply be adjourned to a further trial date. So, so, so the summary case would not fall at a trial stage because of time bars. Okay. Um, and do you, do you think uh, that the, do you think that the closure, because we'd heard from uh, at least one witness, uh, that the closure of uh, a sheriff court or the reduction in the number of courts was leading to longer uh, lo longer times before trials started and had put additional burdens onto. Uh, the sheriff courts that remain, is that something that you would recognise? Um, not at all in any, in, in, in any way, shape or fashion. Um, court closures were a, a very sensitive, sensitive and a very emotive issue and I absolutely fully understand that. Equally at the time of court closures, there was very few people saying that fundamentally court closures weren't the right thing, um, but very much about not in my area. So there was a, a general view that some sense of, of closures might be sensible and that's the, that's the direction we went down. And it's really helpful, I think, just to keep it in perspective that we closed 10 share of courts. Um, so that meant that 10 share of courts took business in from those courts that closed. The remaining 29 share of courts had absolutely no impact whatsoever. So 75% of the courts had no impact at all from court closures. Of the 10 share of courts that took business in, every single one of those share of courts has improved performance since that court closed. So we have less trials that are outstanding in those courts, um, we have shorter periods to trial, um, and we're fully meeting the 16 week waiting period between first coil and trying, and fully meeting the period for domestic abuse cases. So as far as we're concerned, the resources have been put in, um, in all of those courts, the same staff, the same judiciary transfer to those courts, and we knew that we had capacity within those courts to deal with in the business. So uh, you know, I can understand that why court closure sometimes becomes a, almost a convenient coat hanger, um, but in terms of its impact on the system, um, it's, it's not had any effect whatsoever, and in 75% of the courts, it could have no effect, um, because there was no impact on, on those courts at all. Um, Liam MacArthur, followed by Rona and then Fulton. Thanks very much, uh, Camilla. I, again, I think we find ourselves in the situation where we've got um, evidence at direct odds with what we've heard uh, previously, both from the, the bar associations and from um, Police Federation about the impact of, of uh, court closures. Uh, can I though, turn to um, a follow-up to Oliver Mundell's question in relation to I think you touched on it, actually, Mr McQueen, um, but in your written evidence you talk as far as possible evidence should be agreed in advance and trials scheduled only when it's clear that they will take place and evidence will be, will be laid. It's not, I think we've heard that from a few witnesses now. Um, I mean, to your mind, um, how close are we to achieving that and what would you see as the, the obstacles to, to uh, achieving a situation that, that really would make the, the, the functioning of our courts more efficient in that respect? Uh, I think it's fair to say we're getting closer. Um, I mean, at the moment, there's legislative constraints to that, so there need to be a, a quite fundamental change in legislation to allow that to happen. At the moment, what we have done, and, and through the, the, the work that Tim's leading, Tim might well want to add to this, mm. what we are currently trying to design jointly at the moment, and this includes working very closely with the legal profession, 
um, is a, a model of how a system might operate in the future. So how could we move away from a model where the reliance was on everyone physically appearing in court, um, evidence only being able to be given largely in court, and all judicial decisions made within a court environment? So how could we move much more into a case management type system that's not about individuals coming to court, but it's about evidence being available, shared at a very, very early stage, case management process kicking in to make sure that evidence is agreed and trials only proceeding where it is something that needs to be resolved by a trial and, and, and witnesses cited. So what we have done at the moment is, is work through a model and we've made these publicly available in terms of our last two reports. Um, we're just finalising the current stage of our model and if that's agreed by the Justice Board, it would then need to go to government who would then take a view in terms of whether they want to consult on future legislation to make that change. Back, back to the point the convener was, was quizzing you on in, in relation to the Justice Board, I think one, one of the organisations that's perhaps raised um, concerns about how this might work in practice has been um, defence agents. Um, I, I, I think in terms of the discussions the Justice Board are taking place, is that being done in full consultation with defence agents at the moment? Yeah, good time for you to get in because I mean, the, the legal profession are playing a full role in both of these groups. Yeah, we're currently um, taking forward a work stream um, under the Evidence and Procedure Review, we published a report in February uh, this year that set out a, an overall high-level model of what a new digitally-enabled case management-led summary justice system would look like. And we said we need to actually put the flesh on the bones of that, so we put together a working group that involves two um, nominees from the Law Society of Criminal Law Committee uh, who have been fully involved in a discussion on taking the summary justice system step-by-step step with the aim of reducing the number of hearings in court and also the number of witnesses that are cited to attend court and to use digital technology to enable far more interaction between the parties before a trial diet is set. And all the evidence suggests, and this is something that both the defence agents in the group have suggested, is that the more there can be dialogue between the Crown and defence prior to setting a trial date, the more likely you are to get an early resolution of cases and that the cases that do proceed to trial do so on the basis of a much more narrowed down uh, set of issues and that means you can narrow down the number of witnesses that you require to speak to those issues. So um, this model is, is very much a prototype that has been developed, as I say, in partnership with all the justice agencies and the Law Society and we're still working on it, so it's not yet finalised, and we will then take it forward. And if it looks like it's something that could be delivered, um, it's something then we would put to the Scottish Government for their consideration. It would require legislation, and it would require um, some investment in technology to enable the early uh, disclosure of evidence, the early sharing of evidence, and a case management system that allowed that early dialogue between Crown and defence in order to get to those early resolu resolutions that we're looking for. Can you just very, very quickly, I, it's on a completely different issue, but could I ask ACC Higgins to, to look at the evidence we got from Mr McHugh and Mr Little in, rela in relation to the use of fixed penalties and the way that those are being applied? I think there was one example of um, uh, four fixed penalties in the space of half an hour being um, presented to, to an individual who clearly had alcohol uh, problems and, and there was no way um, he was ever going to pay for them. I think the evidence we've heard this morning would bear a, a, a response from, from Police Scotland, perhaps not now, but certainly once you've had a chance to read the evidence from, from this morning. Yeah. Could I just make a, a comment on that point about the, the, the fixed penalties? Um, I, I think the, the issues that the JPs recognise, I, I think, have been issues. Um, and certainly in the, the introduction a couple of years ago, there were a number of cases like that, and we worked very closely with both um, the Crown and, and Police Scotland to reduce those numbers. That has been happening. So it's something we do keep a, a regular track on. Um, but I also want to just add the point in terms of the, the direct measures, the recovery levels are actually very high on them. Um, so the, the fines enforcement is effective, it is delivering for the direct measures in both the, the police and Crown. The recovery rate is over 80%, which is a, is a good figure by any means. Um, and in relation to any fines imposed by the JP or the Sheriff Court, it's closer to 100%. So our recovery rates are high. We work very closely with um, the organisations, DWP, HMRC, and we do make regular benefit, benefit deductions. I think at the moment we have something in the region um, of about 200 
100,000 benefit deductions that have been imposed. So find recovery is, is difficult, it is challenging for some of the reasons that we outlined, um, but it's a role that we take very, very seriously and we do apply quite strenuously. I think it would mean, be interesting to see the, the, the figures, but even if you're talking about a 20% um, um, failure to recover, then presumably they, those will fall into the categories that the JPs were, were outlining yeah. to us. And, and the, the capacity to not just have benefit reductions, but in a sense to apply a, a repayment um, mechanism that is proportionate, proportionate to, to the individuals, uh, absolutely. I think yeah. is, is again. And, and I, think, I think the point you made was, or, or, or the wider point I think came out of it, I think also there's sometimes a a decision on some of the cases that we bring into the criminal justice system, is that the best way of dealing with it? Mm. So when there are genuinely people that have drug addictions, behaviouring, so, social type problems, um, is the criminal justice system always the right answer? Um, or should there actually be some diversions that take them away from criminal justice and more directly into support and rehabilitation type services? I, I think there's a, a, a relevant and a right discussion about actually how do we best use the criminal justice system and is it right in every case for every individual? Okay. It certainly led on to the marking of cases, and I was no doubt that um, it was a very live issue at the Justice Association meeting I attended on Sunday. Rona, followed Thank by you. Fulton. Yeah, we've heard during um, previous evidence sessions that some complainers and witnesses are actually frightened to go to court. Um, and this can be just, you know, going for a cup of tea and meeting the, the, the accused, etc. Um, and they fail to turn up. And is this something that you recognise? And if you do, can you suggest any way that this could be improved? Is it the physical layout of the actual court building that's causing the problems? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely something we recognise. I don't, I don't have any, any, any doubts at all. I mean, I, I think in the last couple of years we've made significant improvements in terms of the way we deal with witnesses. And I think some of the, the JPs talked about some of that this morning. Um, but you know, we certainly haven't cracked it and we're not being complacent. I think there's still, there's still more that can be done. Um, we carried out significant work over the last couple of years involving Victim Support Scotland, where we looked at the whole mapping of the victims and witnesses' journey and how they, they move between the different organisations and how we put in the best standards of support. Um, we've tried to agree and now publish new standards of services that we apply in terms of how we support and how we communicate witnesses. But there's simply no getting away from the fact that coming into a court building on the day, despite the information and despite the, 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 the support that was given previously, is, is a very intimidating type process for many witnesses. The design of our court buildings is not great. Um, the vast majority of court buildings hark back to the, the sort of Victorian type age. Um, there are historic buildings, there's limitations in terms of how we can do that. We try very hard to make sure, and there is segregated defence um, and crown witness areas in all places, and we have excellent support from Witness Service, um, which is provided by Victim Support Scotland, who play, to be quite honest, a superb role across all of the courts um, in taking in witnesses that are vulnerable that have concerns and trying to support them, put them at ease and get them in their best place um, to give their best possible evidence in court. But there's no doubt at all, it's a, it's a difficult experience, it's a challenging experience and there are limitations in, in terms of the best things we can achieve. And then, again, I think part of this discussion comes around to, well, do we just accept that or do we try something different? And the work that Tim was outlining in terms of evidence and procedure review is very much about trying to do two things. One, to reduce, first of all, vast the number of witnesses that need to come to court at all, which is a step in the right direction. But secondly, trying to test and explore the areas where witnesses' evidence can be given at a much earlier stage, much nearer, closer to the, the time of the, the event that happened, and pre-recorded and then used in evidence. So again, within the work that we're trying to do, it's about how we reuse technology in a different way to capture evidence at the earliest stage and prevent witnesses having to come to court other than cases where it's absolutely essential. And certainly in terms of the, the High Court, what we are looking to do in a, in a very short space of time in early into next year is try to apply that as wide as we can, particularly to children. So how do we avoid children having to come into court at all to give evidence? So we believe that with an existing legislation and with practice notes coming from the Lord Justice Clark, we can move to a world which will very quickly start to see children taken out of the court environment, certainly in relation to the more serious court in the High Court. In, in the high court. And we'd look to try and expand that. So yes, we recognise that there are big issues. We're trying to do the best practical things we can within the constraints, um, but equally part of the drive is actually how do we stop them being there in the first place. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. 
Probably some of your answer relates to some of the, the um, measures that might be in the justice um, digital strategy. The committee has heard criticism about the lack of progress with the strategy and also concerns about the effect of um, sharing of a secure email, the effectiveness of that, and about the security of the Wi-Fi system. Could you give us timescales, first of all, of how that's progressing, the actual strategy? I think part of the challenge is that the strategy covers probably about 15 different areas across different organisations that have got responsibility. Um, so to give you one answer on the timescale would be very, very difficult. Um, I, know in, I, I know in terms of the, some, some kind the, of the Scottish um, Courts and Tribunal Service, um, some of the things that we had given that strategy commitment was to roll out a new case management for civil business in Scotland, and that, that was rolled out last Monday. Um, so we've made a, a fundamental change in terms of the case management system that's now available. We now have wireless across all of our courts in Scotland. Um, so that is there, it is usable, it is accessible, it is secure, um, and there are no issues with it. We are now working with the Law Society and the faculty to electronically bring on board all of those members so they now have access to it. So in a very short space of time, and hopefully a short number of weeks, um, every member of the Law Society or faculty or defence agents will have access to Wi-Fi across courts. Again, that's a, that's a step in the right direction. The... Less, yes, I, mean, yeah. I say it's in place in the courts yeah. just now. It's just simply getting the right registration process um, in place for defence agents to access it. The, the area which I think is of, of most interest is, is what's loosely classed as the, the digital evidence vault. And we see this as being one of the key areas that will solve a number of problems that are currently around at the moment. Um, you mentioned the CAGSM system as being one issue which is causing frustration, and the other issue that causes frustration is particularly in relation to video evidence in, in different formats um, and how it can be shared across organisations. The idea of the digital evidence vault is to try to see if we can get through some of those problems. Um, so the idea is that this would be a, a central store or a repository that would hold evidence associated with a case, which would then be securely accessed by organisations or defences from, from different points. Now, where we are at the moment, and obviously you realise this is quite a, a complex development, is it's kicked off a prototype now, which is about building um, an evidence store about storing video evidence. Yeah, so how do we get ev video evidence out of the many hundreds of different formats that exist at the moment into one common format, have it stored in the same area and make that accessible by different justice organisations. And through time, what we look that to be is the, the key part of the evidence vault that supports the work that Tim was describing earlier um, about how we get this evidence sharing across all organisations and across different defence agents. So we're, we're making process, but this is, it's big clunky stuff, it takes time. I'm very conscious of time. I'm very conscious that Fulton McGregor has been waiting for quite some considerable time to get in, so Fulton. Thanks, Convener. I, um, I, I do appreciate that the questioning that, um, that, that I'm going to do is, is, is getting back and the conversation's moved on, but uh, it's back to Claire Baker's earlier question, and it would be no surprise at all that I completely agree with Claire's line of questioning and the response from, from ACC Higgins. Um, what I would do is I'd like to give ACC Higgins a chance, though, to confirm, I think I know the answer, but to confirm that some of the criticism that perhaps we've heard through the, um, the, the process is that the police and subsequently the procurator are um, prioritising the cases of domestic abuse, quite rightly so, I don't think anybody disagrees with that, but to the detriment of others, other cases. And I'd just like to give, uh, for the record, um, ACC Higgins a chance to, to confirm that that's not the case. Um, uh, thank you, sir. I would confirm that's not the case. Um, police officers are demand-driven. Um, we don't get to choose what calls are made to us, and we have to respond to them all. Um, if a domestic abuse call comes in, then yes, that will get a priority. But if a shoplifting call comes in as well, that will be answered as well. You know, um, in terms of prosecutorial um, priority, again, that would be a matter for Crown Office. But uh, I can assure you, um, we try and service all the demand that comes in. Uh, and I guess, uh, if I may, convene, just to give Mr MacArthur some reassurance around the, the fixed penalty, we will, we will have a look at that. But about six months ago, we, in conjunction with Crown, introduced recorded police warnings. Um, so far, there's been about 11,000 of them given. Uh, and that's 11,000 um, non-cases that have been submitted or non-fixed penalty notices that have been issued. 
So rather than give somebody, rather than caution and charge somebody or give them a fixed penalty notice, they're dealt with by way of a recorded police warning. If they receive two recorded police warnings within a set time um, for the same offence, then they are cautioned and charged. So that will reduce the number of fixed penalties that will be uh, issued in the future, um, which hopefully will, will give another uh, proportionate response to, to fairly low level crime. A very quick question for Eric McQueen as well. It's a follow-up from, um, from, from Rona McQuay's uh, question and also staying on the, the issue of, um, of domestic uh, abuse. When we've been doing this uh, uh, inquiry, um, we've, we've spoken to some victims and we've heard some quite harrowing uh, tales of not only the abuse that they, they experienced but also their subsequent experience of the court system. And I think you began to touch on it but specifically for this uh, type of offence, is there anything that you can think of that we could do to improve um, the process for victims of domestic abuse when they're coming in and out to court uh, specifically? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think there's two things. I think in the short term, it's about continuing the good things that we are doing. Um, so already we are trying to improve the facilities in courts. We have far more TV links now that are available if people want to give their evidence by TV links. And we are improving where we can the experience in court. Um, so we now, I think there was a comment made in the past about screens that are pulled out within court that were quite flimsy. All of those are now being largely replaced across our court. So where people want to give evidence behind a screen, it's now in a place which is a safer and a more comfortable environment for them. Um, interestingly, the vast majority of vulnerable witnesses that come forward, their preference is to give evidence in court. Um, we had thought when the change came in with the Vulnerable Witnesses Act, there would be a big increase in people preferring to give evidence by video link. But it does seem very much that people want to give their evidence in court. And certainly our aim is to make sure that we support them as, as best we can, to make sure they've got a safe environment, somewhere they're comfortable, and that they can give their best evidence. And if they choose to use screens to block them from the, from the accused, then, then all of those type of things are in place. So I say we're trying within the... I suppose the limitations we've got to provide the best possible service. Um, all of our staff and frontline staff have gone through quite extensive training in terms of how we support not just vulnerable witnesses, but all witnesses that come within the court environment. And really in the medium and long term, it's back to what we were talking about earlier about fundamentally how do we shift a significant number of witnesses from having to give evidence in court in the first place. And, and I think that's got to be our, our goal and where our focus stays while at the same time we build on the improvements that we're making at the moment to try to make the experience for victims and witnesses um, the less traumatic and the less stressful that we can possibly achieve. Yep, thanks for that. And one final very short question, a specific question from Stuart Stevenson, which should elicit a very um, equally short response. Um, the rules for committees in the Parliament here at 4.37 read, a member may be present at a committee, count towards the quorum and participate fully by means of video conference. Are we heading towards that same interaction with video technology right across all aspects of the court system? And if not, when? I'd like to think we're getting there. The honest answer is we're probably still um, in the early days. We have limitations in terms of the current legislation as to what can be done by video conferencing. So at the moment, any custody hearings can't be done by VC. And the same with trials, other than vulnerable witnesses, it requires people to appear physically in court. There are a range of procedural hearings which we are now moving more routinely being done by VC. So about a third of our courts now are transaction procedural business by video conferencing, and we're looking to extend that to other courts next year. Um, when the provisions come in, hopefully in May next year, um, custody cases will be able to take taken by VC, and we're working with Police Scotland and Crown as to how we could implement that. The answer to where we truly want to go in VC is back to the work that was Tim was talking about earlier on. Yep, that genuinely is about capturing evidence at the various stage electronically and reducing significantly the number of victims and witnesses in court. Questions. It only remains for me to thank the witnesses very much for attending committee today. We now move into private session. The next meeting of the committee will be on 29th November when we will continue taking evidence from the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service Inquiry. I suspend the meeting to allow the public and official record to leave, report to leave the room.